Good morning. Um, uh, welcome to the AHTB AFIDS Day 2020. Our sincere apologies for the technical issues. We've lost an hour and uh, we are really sincerely apologetic for that. It, it, we had a technical issue which has now been resolved. Welcome again to the AHTB AFIDS Day 2020. My name is Grace Choto. I'm an AHTB Knowledge Exchange Manager for Vegetables. Why are we here? The new AHTB frame and control. We know that aphid control is now a challenge across crops. Uh, although detection and monitoring is established, prevent and control is now a major issue following the loss of effective chemistry. So our thinking was how can we prevent control aphids effectively with currently available options? Uh, and we wanted to hold a series, uh, we thought to hold a series of cross-sector presentations on the state of the art prevent and control before breaking out into crop specific brainstorm sessions, we will use new knowledge and our own experiences to draft aphid control strategies for next season. What are we after? Well, at the end of this day, we will have facilitated discussion sessions where you will have a facilitator in the room with you to, um, to really chat about uh, how aphid control could be changed for next season using the information you would have attained from the day's proceedings as well as your own experiences. But also in those sessions, we might end up with more questions than answers. So we need you to identify the gaps in AFID control armory that could be taken forward in AHDB funded work. So just to say it is teamwork, including you as delegates, we need you to be frank and open with us to tell us where the gaps are so we can really work along the lines which will address uh, prior, um, priority issues on AFID control. Again, just to thank the team, although we had technical issues here, we've got an IS team, we're at HQ, we've got the events team with me, we've got uh, Rosemary Collier, who was the chair of this event with us in the room, and also a number of AHDB staff who've contributed uh, to this day. So my sincere, sincere thanks. Um, I'm the front man, but really the message is there's a huge team behind me in planning of the program and in delivery, so thank you. So you are muted, so we don't pick up any background noise. If you've got questions, please type them as we go. We'll answer them at the end of each session. The timing has changed. We're running an hour late, so everything will be an hour later. We are encouraging our speakers not to hurry up or anything like that. We've put a lot of effort into this day. We will run to time. The first sessions, the plenary will be recorded. Um, and our apologies if you have to escape. The breakout sessions will not be recorded and you may miss those, but we'll have them after lunch break now. Uh, we have applied for basis and Rosso, and you can um, get those in the next slide. I'll show you how. So for questions on your screen, if you hover your uh, mouse, you should have a band uh, with a little question icon. If you uh, click on it, you'll get a broad band on your right right hand side. And if you go down, you'll, go, uh, you'll see somewhere it says ask a question and you can type in your questions and put them in as we go. But like I said, we'll answer them at the end of each session because we've divided the day into three sessions before the breakout discussions. Our first session will be on aphid control issues, products and trials. Um, we'll have Rosemary Collier set the scene on how fruit, vegetable and potato agronomy structured IPM strategies for the 2020 season and the challenges uh, encountered. Uh, Rosemary will then speak again on managing aphids, opportunities and constraints, uh, after which Joe will speak on uh, giving an update on aphicide approvals. We'll have a break at that time at 10 o'clock um, um, after the questions. So we'll have the questions after Joe. After the break, we'll have a session on biopesticides or bioprotectants. We have presentations from product suppliers on conditions necessary to maximize the efficacy of their products. We'll start off with an AHDB funded presentation on a project, uh, the uh, AHDB Amber project from Dave Chandler of uh, Warwick Crop Center, the University of Warwick. And he will speak on key messages to improve on biopesticide efficacy and application. This will be followed by Jack Hill on Flipper and Sarage on Naturalis and Tech Bomb and Harry Raleigh on Botanic Garden and Spruce It. We'll then have another uh, comfort break. 
after which we'll have our final session before the facilitated discussion. Uh, this session will be on exclusion, resistance management and building IPM programs. Uh, so we have sent out in the program an intercropping video. We hope you've watched it. Uh, Rosemary will do a Q&A on it, a short Q&A, followed by Anne Stone of AHDB and Alan Frost of Agrolan, and they will cover exclusion netting. We'll then have a talk from Steve Foster uh, on insecticide resistance monitoring and management and Rob Jacobson on building IPM programs using peppers as an example. Uh, we'll then ha a move on. Uh, we'll have after this, we'll have a, a lunch break. I think 20 minutes will be sufficient uh, just to save us a bit of time. Uh, but then we'll uh, come back again to give you those arrangements. So let me introduce you to our chair and our first session speakers. Um, our chair is Professor Rosemary Collier of Warwick Crop Centre, School of Life Sciences, the University of Warwick. Rosemary is an, an entomologist who has worked on insect pests of horticultural crops for many years. Her main research interest is in the development and application of IPM strategies for horticultural crops. And Rosemary is also a member of the Royal Horticultural Society Science Committee, chair of the UK Insecticide Resistance Action Group and coordinator of the IPM Working Group for the European Vegetable Research Institute's network. Um, so we also have Joe. Uh, you probably know these faces because really they are front faces <laughs> for us here. Rosemary does a lot of work on aphids and insect pests, but also Joe Martin, who's uh, our senior crop protection scientist. Uh, Joe manages a range of different crop protection projects within the HDB. He's lead on the Scepter Plus program and the Ember project, uh, project, and he leads on weeds and weeds control. So I'm handing over to Rosemary now. Over to you, Rosemary. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to what I think is going to be a very interesting session today. I'm just trying to share my slides. Oops, have I done that? They bounced out. Oh, OK, right. Sorry about the delay uh, problems with the slides. Right. So again, welcome. And I'm really sorry that we can't see you all today. What I'm going to do first is set the scene uh, using information uh, provided by uh, a number of crop experts. And the focus of the scene setting will be the, the five types of crops that you see on the right hand side and obviously the first four of those will be the focus of the breakout groups later in the day. So potatoes, brassicas, carrots and lettuce have a number of aphid pests in common so what I thought I'd do is start by showing um, a graph uh, of the suction trap captures of um, five of the main species um, just to give you an overview of what happened in 2020. So you can see that the willow carrot aphid, the peach potato aphid and the cabbage aphid had large peaks of activity and most of that occurred between the middle of May and early July and then that was followed by potato aphid and the also black bean aphid. I'm now going to move on to the first crop, potatoes, with information provided by John Surrup. And first of all, uh, an overview of 2020. So as the graph showed, high numbers of peach potato aphid and willow carrot aphid, just as crops were emerging up to rapid growth. Um, this is the typical pattern, um, although the peak uh, in aphid activity varies from year to year. Obviously, virus is the main issue with potatoes, and in 2019, 25% of seed stocks in England were downgraded due to virus, um, a less amount of seed stocks from Scotland. And the same thing happened with the, the Dutch seed stocks as well. And the problem is that most of these stocks were grown as ware in 2020, uh, providing inoculum for 2020 seed crops, so continuing the cycle. In terms of problems for potatoes, then um, the proximity of seed uh, crop production to ware production, 
volunteers, loss of pesticide actives, mild winters, resistance to pyrethroids, reliable tuber sampling and testing, the need for a reliable deterrent to keep aphids out of the crop, the issues associated with managing rented land, a need for better understanding of mature plant resistance, and the fact that virus can, can come with the input seed. In terms of the current strategy, then the aim is to use isolated sites for high grade production, to use younger generation seed if possible, and encourage land suppliers to manage volunteers. Frequent applications of mineral oil from first emergent may also be part of this strategy, and we're going to talk about that later on. Also, it's important to avoid the use of pyrethroids early on. Um, yellow water trap data is very useful and it sometimes growers have to spray every three to four days um, from emergence to stable um, canopy cover. I'm now going to move on to carrots with information provided by Howard Hines. And again, record numbers of willow carrot aphid and peach potato aphid. Um, the wet autumn and winter in 2019 meant that a lot of carrot crops uh, were unharvested and also unstrawed. Um, and so any um, carrot aphids actually overwintering in the carrot crops uh, were a reservoir for infesting crops in 2020 spring. It was the second year without cruiser seed dressing. And in fact, it, it became the worst virus year in some regions since 2015, with yield reductions of up to 30% because of virus. So in terms of the current strategy, then growers are reliant on foliar sprays. Um, there's a limited number of products. Um, it's important to identify the window for treatments. Um, yellow water trap data are most useful because of local differences, um, but the day degree forecast is also useful and indeed that could be localised. Moving on to brassicas with information from Andy Richardson, then again early flights of both cabbage aphid and peach potato aphid and this led to significant pressure from aphids from the middle of May to the middle of July and most long season brassica crops received three to four sprays in this period. Fortunately following the naturally occurring aphid crash in mid-July, um, numbers of aphids never really increased again, um, which is probably due to the wetter conditions, um, but without two sprays of Biscaya, it would have been a disaster. <clears throat> Growers used more biological, physical acting insecticides this season than ever before, um, but mostly their performance has been disappointing, and Andy thinks this is down to timing and application technique. And then despite a recent 30% reduction in oilseed rape area, turnip yellow virus is still a real threat um, and can reduce yields by up to 55%. In terms of the, the, the treatment programme for next year, then Andy has mapped out um, a, a few programmes which will be discussed in the breakout group. Um, but just to flag up that for long season brassic crops, um, it looks like there's likely to be a gap in terms of conventional options towards the end of the season and kale, uh, kale crops there is a very limited um, number of treatments that can be applied. I'm now going to move on to outdoor lettuce with information from Liz Johnson. Again, high populations of peach potato aphid. Um, lettuce root aphid appeared in Lancashire. I'm not sure whether it appeared elsewhere. Um, black bean aphid was active in June, July, and there were some uh, infestations, sporadic infestations of current lettuce aphid towards the end of the summer. In terms of current strategy, then this relies on extensive crop monitoring, uh, resistant varieties where they're available and suitable, um, aphid monitoring data, careful timing of approved products um, and consideration of natural populations of beneficial insects, although these can be a contamination issue in the harvested crop at times. In terms of concerns, then there is also with lettuce a concern about transmission of virus and the other major concern um, and related to that is the, the need for new chemistry, um, both for foliage aphids and for lettuce root aphids. 
The final group of crops are fruit um, with information provided by Jonathan Blackman. And obviously that covers a, a range of species and a range of different cropping systems. So in terms of tree fruit, fruit in 2020, then um, rosy apple aphid was more difficult to control um, and the dry spring may, may have made systemic insecticides less effective. Uh, woolly aphid and green citrus aphid um, were also problems. For pears, uh, pear bed straw aphid was an issue and on cherries, black cherry aphid. And both of those may be due to the, the dry spring. And then for plums, Plum leaf curling aphid uh, is a regular pest, um, but it infects some varieties more than others. In terms of soft fruit, then potato aphid uh, was a persistent issue in protected crops um, and melon cotton aphid an issue later in the year. For raspberries, then there are very limited aphid controls available as insecticides are being used for other pests at different timings need not to upset biocontrols for spider mite. And in fact, uh, aphids and raspberries don't do much direct damage, um, but they can be virus vectors. For blueberries, then aphids attract hoverflies um, and the larvae can contaminate the fruit at harvest. For black currants, no major problems in 2020, but concerns about a lack of insecticides for 2021. In terms of the strategy for tree food, fruit, then for apples, um, little insecticides are applied pre and post flowering. It's important to look after earwig populations, they're generalist predators, and to keep woolly aphid numbers low enough for aphelinus to get adequate control by late summer. For pears, pre and post flowering insecticides are applied. And again, it's important to look after natural enemies. Uh, cherries are very reliant on insecticides, but there are also differences in varietal susceptibility. And for plums, a pre-bloom insecticide is required as damage is done by leaf curling aphid um, if growers wait until petal fall. And then in terms of the strategy for soft fruit, um, for strawberries, early treatment is essential, but it's important to avoid pyrethroids as biocontrols um, be, are used for western flower thrips and mite control. Um, raspberries, there's possibly some benefit where Bavaria bassiana is used for control of spider mites. Um, for blueberries, it's important to monitor and treat only if necessary. And for black currants, um, an autumn spray for returning migrants is common practice. So probably most of this is no surprise uh, to those of you who have been involved in, in growing crops this year. Um, but I thought I would just flag up um, a number of common themes. Um, first of all, the weather. And obviously we can't do anything about that. And then virus. And that is obviously uh, the most important issue, more important than aphid presence in a number of crops. Then a lack of active ingredients, uh, which puts selection pressure on those that remain and a need to control other pests, which can sort of interfere with the aphid control program. Insecticide res resistance can be an issue and, and that's particularly to pyrethroids. And obviously pyrethroids can also have adverse effects on beneficials. There appears to be a limited role for biopesticides at the moment, and obviously that's something uh, that's going to be discussed later on. And the location of crops and particularly issues associated with rented land can be important. There was quite a lot of mention of monitoring, sampling and testing, and then in some cases consideration of sources of pests and virus. And obviously there are some differences. So. We've, I've been talking about annual versus perennial versus protected crops. Um, I think one thing that does slightly stand out is the, the, the role of natural enemies. Um, I guess there's a sort of implication that they're more effective um, and important in fruit. And obviously natural enemies can themselves be contaminants in some crops. So I'm going to stop here with the, the scene setting and just say thank you to John, Andy, Jonathan, Howard and Liz um, for the really brilliant sets of information. Thank you.
Right, so I'm now going to go on to my second um, presentation. I'm presuming that's still on the screen, is it? Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to start the, the slideshow. OK, so in this section, um, I'm going to talk about managing aphids and I'm going to talk about some of the possible opportunities and um, constraints. Um, so. Basically, um, what whoops, how do I go backwards? <laughs> ah, sorry. Done it right. Sorry. So basically, um, what I'm going to be talking about is integrated pest management (IPM), and there are many definitions. I particularly like this definition, which is that it's a decision-based process involving coordinated use of multiple tactics for optimizing the control of all classes of pests in an ecologically and economically sound manner. And I think the economically sound is very important. So IPM has been talked about for a number of decades, um, but I think we've actually got to the point now um, with outdoor crops where we do need IPM. And that's because of a lack of insecticides, insecticide resistance, and the great need to protect and employ biodiversity. And most particularly, we need the non-insecticidal tools. So there are various ways of describing and presenting IPM, but again, I quite like the IPM pyramid. And the principle behind that is that when you're planning to grow a crop, you should start at the bottom of the, the pyramid um, and you should look at the range of agronomic practices that you might be able to use uh, to prevent a pest infestation. So these could be crop rotation, resistant varieties, enhancement of beneficials. Once you've done as much as you can with that and the crop has gone into the ground, then it's important to actually keep an eye on pest activity. And this is where detection comes in. And this is where growers can use a range of decision su support tools such as monitoring systems, forecasting systems. And then we come to the, the upper part of the pyramid, um, which focuses on control. Um, so approaches to mechanical, physical and natural control, biological control, which could include biopesticides and natural enemies, and then chemical control right at the top of the pyramid. And the idea is that uh, you use everything you possibly can from the bottom of the pyramid upwards um, so that your application of chemical control agents is minimised. There's obviously been a huge amount of research on aphids as crop pests and particularly on Mises persicae. Um, but actually, I think there's still much we don't know about individual species. Um, and this is information that we actually might need to know um, quite soon. So I'm going to talk a bit first about the IPM tools towards the, the top of the pyramid. Um, so that's in terms of control. And obviously, AHCB have put it, been putting a lot of resource into um, particularly chemical control and biological control. And for new insecticides, and sometimes this is insecticides that are new uh, to particular crops, um, then the SEPTA Plus project has been screening um, a large number of these. And this also applies to um, biological control agents and biopesticides. And together, the SEPTA Plus and AMBER projects have been gathering um, a lot more information about biopesticides, uh, but there's still a lot more to learn about how to use them optimally. And in outdoor crops, there, there may also be some instances where releases of predators and parasitoids is viable. And then at the bottom, there's mechanical, physical and natural control. And just one example uh, is physical barriers, um, which can be very effective methods of pest control if the crop doesn't suffer and if it's economically viable. 
And obviously, aphids trapped under netting um, can be a lot worse than no netting at all. So just to focus a bit on uh, some of the work that has been done in the SEPTA Plus project on aphids, um, and this is work that we've done at Warwick, where we've screened a number of conventional insecticides, coded products against four of the, the main um, species of pest aphid. And basically, all of those products um, have been very effective. Some of them have been um, pretty uh, persistent for a few weeks as well. Um, there are a couple of, of places where they've been less effective. Um, and we think that possibly um, the formulation uh, is an issue there. We've also screened um, quite a large number of, of biopesticides. And here, the, uh, the control has been more variable. But again, there are instances, certain um, pest uh, product combinations that have been extremely effective. So SEPTA Plus and SEPTA before it have led to uh, and been associated with a number of approvals. And here are just some of the recent emus linked with SEPTA Plus um, that mainly relate to aphids. And then there are other approvals and emus in the pipeline, including three products for, for aphid control. And Joe Martin is going to talk a bit more about this after I've finished. So now on to the subject of mineral oils, and this has been a particular interest to potato growers. Um, and I think they've been following closely um, the use of mineral oils in Canada, um, where they have been applied alone or with insecticides, and they've been shown to reduce uh, PVY spread. These treatments uh, appear to have been applied quite frequently, um, and studies have shown that the more sprays are applied, um, the less virus damage there is. Two oils are also approved in Belgium, uh, and again, they have been applied quite frequently. However, these are grey products in the UK, um, and they're not approved at the moment for pest control. But researchers and AHCB are now working with companies, and they're hoping to use the results from some 2020 trials in applications for approvals, uh, and these will be approvals for pest control. Um, so then these treatments will be able to be used legally. So that's a bit about control at the top of the pyramid, and obviously we'll be discussing that later in the day. Um, but um, I've been thinking um, for the last few years, months, um, about how we go forward. And I think perhaps we need to increase our focus on the bottom of the IPM pyramid. Um, so that's things like crop rotation, resistant varieties, polyculture, so growing more than one uh, species in the field, and conservation biocontrol. And just to flag up um, that some of these are uh, likely just to reduce pest pressure rather than completely eliminate it, but I think they have an important contribution to make um, to pest control. So first of all, crop rotation at a landscape scale. And I think we need to think more carefully about where pests and virus come from. And growers may have to base their rotation, their crop location on this information. They may also have to cooperate with other farmers, growers in the area to manage pests. And there may be a need to manage pests better at source. Uh, for example, the role of aphids that overwinter on carrot. Obviously, an understanding of insect biology is key. And one of the unknown factors is the distance that winged aphids travel. Um, so how much long distance flight is there versus uh, local flight? I'm now going to move on to host plant resistance. And lettuce is probably uh, the best example. Um, for current lettuce aphid, then there is um, complete resistance available in a number of varieties, and this is due to a single dominant gene which came from a species of wild lettuce. The numbers of varieties with this resistance has increased over the years, and that has led to high selection pressure. And so now, um, in fact, um, groups of resistance-breaking aphids have evolved. 
um, and the resistance has effectively broken down after about 10 years, although there are still places um, where aphids um, will still succumb to host plant resistance. In terms of lettuce root aphid, then amazingly, the source of resistance was identified 60 years ago, and that was at Wellsbourne. Um, at the time, some resistant varieties were bred and used commercially. Um, but more recently, um, since lettuce root aphid has been controlled by treatments applied for other aphids, um, resistance has sort of gone down the, the, uh, the scale a bit. However, these insecticides, which are the neonic seed treatments, have now been withdrawn. Um, and once again, host plant resistance is of great interest. So that's resistance to, to aphids, um, but there's no reason why we shouldn't look for resistance to viruses as well. Um, and just one example in brassicas, then our, our colleague John Walsh at, at Warwick um, has identified natural plant resistant genes to turnip mosaic virus, so it can be done. So sugar beet growers are obviously in the same position as, as those growing potato and carrot and other field crops um, because the neonic seed treatment has also gone there. And so BBRO have been working closely with breeders to test new variety for resistance and tolerance to virus in what they say is one of the largest virus trials undertaken and they call it the Goliath trial. So why not other crops? Um, gene banks and other collections have a lot of potential material. And for example, they could be new targets for research in the Jeffra Veg Vegetable Genetic Improvement Network project. Um, however, um, it's important to identify the specific targets. And for example, what would that be for carrot? Um, and there's a long time scale to get a, vi a finished variety. I just thought I'd, I'd mention GM, obviously a long way off in terms of, of commercial use in the UK, um, but there was some very interesting research done at Rothamsted Research um, where they um, transformed some wheat plants um, so that they would emit the aphid alarm pheromone. So what aphids use the alarm pheromone for is when one of them is disturbed, say, by a natural enemy, it will release the pheromone and that warns the other aphids in the vicinity and they'll start moving and maybe drop off the crop. So anyway, Rothamsted undertook some lab trials using their transgenic wheat um, to determine whether um, this would deter aphids and also attract parasitoids, which is another um, thing that aphid alarm pheromone does. And the results look very promising. And then they took um, the transformed lines out to field trials and it didn't work at all. There was no difference with the untransformed wheat. And one suggestion why uh, they didn't, this didn't work was because uh, when the aphids release uh, the alarm pheromone, they release it in a short burst um, and then it disappears, whereas the, the wheat was releasing the alarm pheromone uh, continuously and maybe the aphids got used to it. Before I move on, I just want to flag up um, one interesting project, which is looking at an IPM approach for aphids on brassica, and that's by combining partial crop resistance with um, approaches to biocontrol, and it's considering peach potato and cabbage aphids. And it's led by Dave Chandler. I think he's going to talk about it a bit more later on, um, and it's a BBSRC SARIC project. And the idea is that you combine um, a, a line, a variety of brassica um, that actually slows down aphid development compared with other lines. And the theory is that if you slow down aphid development, then um, they become more, succes uh, more susceptible um, to biological controls, which might be fungus treatments or, for example, uh, a parasitoid. And at the moment, the, the material being tested are, are plant accessions, so they're not finished varieties, they're breeding lines um, from the collection at Warwick. Now I want to go on to talk about polyculture, um, so increasing the numbers of plant species in a field. 
And you might do this for uh, one of two reasons, either to try and interfere with the process for which, by which an insect finds its host plant, and this could be intercropping, under sowing, companion planting, or the use of trap crops, or it might be used to increase the abundance of natural enemies in the, the vicinity. The latter approach has been shown to be uh, pretty effective um, in orchards, and there have been positive, positive benefits from sowing wildflowers um, in the alleyways uh, between the trees. Um, and this has also be, been boosted by adding refuges for earwigs um, and a hoverfly attractant as well. And the positive effects have included a reduced number of pests and higher numbers of natural enemies, including hoverflies, spiders and lacewings. And perennial wildflowers may also give uh, an added benefit of, of outcompeting undesirable weeds. I'm now going to move on to the um, work which we flagged up in your invitation and, and for which you, we provided a video link, um, which is conservation biocontrol in California. And this is led by Eric Brennan. And in this work, um, they are aiming to reduce aphid infestations in organic lettuce by using sweet allicin to uh, bring adult aphid, uh, adult hoverflies into the crop. Um, so the allicin is a food source uh, for the hoverflies. And when the hoverflies are in the crop, then they lay their eggs on lettuce plants where, um, where they find aphids. And this obviously uh, seems to be a very effective approach. Over the years, Eric has um, worked on, on, if you like, the uh, spatial deployment of the allicin, mainly to reduce the amount of crop of, of land that, that um, has been lost um, because of growing the allicin there instead of the crop. Um, I've been thinking about whether this would work in the UK. Um, and I think the only issue here is that, that uh, whereas in the USA, in California, hoverflies are around uh, for a, quite a long period, in uh, the UK, we tend to have quite a distinct peak, um, which occurs mainly in August. So other approaches would be needed at other times. So again, to go back to the, the sugar beet growers, um, so they've been doing quite a lot of lateral thinking and they've also been investigating under sowing with barley um, as that's shown some positive effects. And if you look at the image at the bottom, then uh, where the star is, um, that part of the crop has been under sown. They've also looked at the use of brassicas between rows to act as preferred host for, for aphids and at a range of flowering mixes to attract beneficials in the autumn um, to boost numbers in the spring. So I guess sugar beet may be an easier crop uh, to manage with these approaches um, because the appearance of the harvested product doesn't matter. Um, however, some of them, if they worked, uh, they might be quite quick fixes. Now I just wanted to move on and say a bit about insecticides and natural enemies. And from the, the scene setting, um, then there is obviously some certainty about the value of natural enemies in fruit. I think there's probably less certainty about field crops, although Andy alluded to the aphid crash. So obviously natural enemies are susceptible to certain insecticides. And one of the things that we've done recently in Scepter Plus is develop a new database on the effects of chemical insecticides and other treatments on natural enemies of crop pests. And basically, this is to provide background information uh, when you are making decisions about insecticides as part of an IPM strategy. So this brings me on neatly to decision support. Uh, and this is important for the deployment of the tools towards the top of the pyramid. Aphid biology is definitely affected by the weather, which obviously we can't control. And forecasting tries to give advance warning, um, whereas monitoring is about what's happening in real time. In terms of information available to you about aphids, um, then there's a long-term prediction by the Rothamsted Insect Survey in early February each year, 
uh, for some of the important pests of field crops. And then day degree forecasts are available for some of the vegetable and salad aphids. And obviously growers can run their own day degree forecasts with their own weather data. For monitoring, there are a number of sources of information. Um, there are uh, the records from the network of suction traps run in the UK, and these are summarised in AHDB aphid news. And then AHDB potatoes run a network of yellow water traps, um, and these are summarised on the AHDB website. New for 2020, um, with help from Ferro, we extracted specific information on the pest aphids of vegetables and salads from the potatoes network of traps, uh, and they have been summarised in the pest bulletin uh, and on a web, web separate web page as well. And obviously growers can run their own networks of water traps. So just a few final thoughts. So I think all of the crops that I've been talking about are really considered to be minor crops. Um, so most of the tools aren't going to be developed specifically for them. We obviously need to learn more about non-insecticidal control methods, so biopesticides, barriers, etc. We can obviously learn from other crops, although some represent very different systems. And IPM is most advanced in the UK in protected crops, and Rob Jacobson will explain how. Host plant resistance could be one of the most effective solutions, but to which pests and viruses? And obviously there's a long delivery time. And for insecticides, then we need to avoid the development of resistance to new insecticides and to take care of beneficials. I think we really do need to consider how to reduce the initial size of the infestation in crops. And obviously all of this needs to be done in an economically sustainable way. And we aren't the only ones uh, who are needing to think outside the box. So I've already talked about the sugar beet growers, um, and I'd just like to mention um, the impact of cabbage stem flea beetle on oilseed rape. Again, this is due to loss of neonic insecticides, uh, and it has a, had a significant impact um, on the, the yield and success of oilseed rape crops and also on the area grown. So on the left hand side is um, some output from a recent AHDB project on integrated pest management. And this summarises a range of potential tools that might be used as part of an IPM strategy. And most of those are tools at the bottom of the IPM pyramid. And I don't want you to worry about the detail of those, but just look on the right hand side at the key. Um, and you can see that only two of the approaches, um, are, they are confident that they would provide reliable control um, and possibly still research needed. And for all of the other approaches, um, which is either for moderate control or control not proven, um, then much more research is needed. So there's a quite a long way to go with this crop um, and obviously with other crops as well. So I'll stop here uh, and say thank you very much to the AHDB team. It's been a very stressful morning for them and uh, I think they've done really well. Uh, many thanks again to John, Howard, Andy, Jonathan and Liz, um, to a number of colleagues who've provided me with additional information, um, to those who run the suction and water trap networks, to Syngenta for hosting the pest bulletin and to the various companies who support SEPTA Plus and of course my colleagues at Warwick. So thank you for listening and please type in any thoughts and questions. Um, and I'm and I'm now going to introduce uh, Joe Martin. Who's going to talk about some of the work on insecticides and biopesticides. Over to you, Joe. Morning, morning, everybody. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Brilliant.
So hopefully that you can, everybody can see that. Um, what I'm um, hoping to do today is to give you a bit of an, um, an update in terms of where we are with some of our applications to try and um, plug some of those gaps that we've got. Um, but first off, I just thought I'd introduce the EMU team, the regulator team here at AHDB um, and some of the work um, that we get involved in on a day to day um, basis. Talk through some of the regulatory challenges that we're currently facing some of the emergency applications and the process that is involved with that, um, a little bit more about insecticide renewals in Europe, and then like I say, some of those gaps that we're looking at um, plugging at the moment, and then thinking ahead um, past sort of uh, January um, this year as well in terms of regulation. So in terms of the team, there's three of us. So um, I've recently taken on the role that Valletta um, Pauneve had at AHDB before she left. Um, so I've taken on the responsibilities for um, leading on that team and also looking after some specific um, field veg crops, as you can see on the list there. Um, I also um, carry on with the Septa Plus and Amber projects overseeing those. Uh, my two colleagues, so Joe McTeague, um, looks after the ornamentals and uh, protected edible sectors. She's also um, got a lot of experience in terms of OPEX and understanding um, operator exposure studies and also looks after our risk register. So we track um, actives and where they are um, going through renewal, etc., and where we might be coming up against a, an issue um, so that we can be a little bit more uh, pre-warned and be a bit more proactive in terms of applications, um, etc. Adam, um, <clears throat> he's an ex-CRD person, um, so it's great that we've got him on board at AHDB and, and that knowledge, uh, insider knowledge, if you like, um, of, of how the systems work. And he also looks after a number of different crop areas, as you can see, such as asparagus, sweet corn, um, but particularly has focus on tree fruit and soft fruit. So we cover the, the whole of horticulture and we also cover um, cross sector. So we do do work for both potatoes and cereals and oil seeds as well in terms of emergency applications um, for uh, minor uses. So in terms of our sort of day to day work, if you like, and, and what we do and, and where um, the, the money or the levy goes towards, very much it's about those minor use approvals and emergency applications that go on throughout the year. Um, there's a lot of um, discussion and liaison and working with the ag chem industry. Um, so we meet with those regularly um, twice a year um, and there's about 15 companies that we would do that with to understand where they are with their products, um, where we can maybe then use those um, and bring them into horticulture um, and, and, and extend uses in, into, into some of the um, horticultural crops. <clears throat> we look at new products coming through and we look at existing products and, and, and a whole range of other um, different situations. Like I said, we get involved in cross sector applications. So, for example, for potatoes um, and also for cereals and oil seeds. Where we need to, we generate residue data. So often um, companies won't have generated residue data for particularly uh, minor crops. Um, and therefore we would fund that research to help us gain that data, which means that we can then put in those applications or those EMU applications. We meet regularly with a CRD um, as part of the grower liaison group, but also um, other meetings where we need to talk about issues such as emergencies, um, issues with the application process um, or technical projects that might be ongoing. And then we also meet with um, in the EU. So in the EU, there is a minor use coordination facility um, for a number of different crops. And we sit on those and we share information. Um, we share um, costs for residue trials, which helps to bring down that cost to AHDB. And we also gain information on projects um, as well. So there's a whole range of different areas that we work on. Thinking about regulatory challenges that um, probably are, are most testing at, at times for us at the moment um, include um, protected structures and getting an understanding in terms of permanent protection or um, poly <coughs> polytunnels. Um, 
one of the biggest areas at the moment where we're seeing particular difficult regulatory challenges are seed treatments, where we have problems in terms of um, emus where we maybe are using, for example, um, a different seed type um, and that can impact if um, we're trying to um, get a, an approval onto a very small seed um, in horticulture. MRL setting um, currently takes a very long time um, in the EU and that can really delay our UK um, and support for UK authorisations. We are expecting that to change um, in January, which will be a um, welcome relief and CRD are saying that that process um, as they will be setting um, MRLs for the UK should speed up significantly. So we're really looking forward to that. And then I think as Rosemary has already alluded to the number of new actives coming through the system for us to then have use in horticulture are few and far between. I mean, there are some there, um, but but it's not um, like the, the old days where there would be a lot more coming through the um, through the system and, and, and their use. In terms of emergency applications, as you can see this graph here, the number that have gone in um, and have been approved each year has significantly risen over the past few years. And we do see that we get a lot of um, requests for this. Um, emergency applications are very time consuming to, um, to put in. They require a lot of additional information and CRD on repeat um, emergency applications now are also requesting <clears throat> far more additional information than we have ever been asked for before, including monitoring um, information on pests, spray programmes, etc. So we need a lot of input from growers for this um, information and for the application to be successful, then we have to um, provide CRD with us this all this additional information. We're currently going through <clears throat> our planned emergency applications for 2021 <clears throat> and we have to inform CRD by the end of November what they will be. We're also aware that for each application <clears throat> it can be a significant fee and it's approximately £5,000 per application so you can see that cost can soon mount up so we do need to make sure that it is <clears throat> an actual emergency before we can do <clears throat> um, an application. Just looking at some of the products and renewals um, in Europe, you'll see here that there's quite a number um, that we've that we've listed. We do know that CRD for um, actives that have not yet been voted on at EU level and that are due to be approved before December 2023, that CRD is planning to extend the expiry date by three years. However, they do say that they do reserve the right to assess an AI prior to that expiry date. So we may have a little bit of a reprieve on some of these um, over, the, over the next few years as, as Brexit um, moves forward. In terms of work that we're doing to plug the gaps, um, you can see here, um, so we've been working um, with manufacturers in terms of trying to secure approvals um, into a number of different uh, crops. So for example, tapiki um, and carrots. So in 2020, we had an emergency application gained um, for that. Um, for this product, we're planning on a, um, a, an EMU application um, moving forward. As, um, as I mentioned earlier, CRD say that they can um, work on the MRL. So, um, so that's, that's a move forward. Um, so Foxaflor, we're looking at um, putting an application in very soon for that for protected um, leafy veg. And we have um, an agronomist who's very kindly um, helping with the justification um, for need for that. So that will go in very soon. And you can see, um, for example, the gazelle and um, we've got access to some residue data. So wherever possible, we do um, manage to get the manufacturers to um, find residue data that may be generated elsewhere in Europe that we're able to use um, for applications. And moving on to the uh, next slide here. Um, again, we have some um, emus that are um, in process or in progress with um, CRD. CRD can take up to 12 months um, for an application. Um, 
and um, we do find that varies. Um, it depends on the, the nature of the application and, and the volume of data that they have to um, um, sift through. What we are being told is that currently they are exceedingly busy um, and that things may take a little bit longer um, to get things worked through the system, but um, we're working with them to, to provide the information um, as fast as we can. So looking ahead um, and yeah, Brexit is one of those things, but we, we we know that CRD are one of the most experienced and efficient EU regulators um, where there are potential opportunities for there to be a balanced um, science based approach, which would be um, very welcome. Um, we know Northern Ireland will continue to work under the EU pesticide regime. Um, and we will have three devolved governments rather than 27 member states to make decisions. So maybe um, things will will help to speed up. Um, we know that initially there won't be much change, but um, there is possibility for divergence um, over time. We're also aware that a new fee structure um, is coming um, and um, there will be consult consultation on this in April 2022. We are expecting costs um, potentially to rise if they move to a different um, structure or fee structure. So that's pretty much um, all I've got to say. Um, there's the three of us there. Um, if you've got any questions or comments or you want to get in touch, then, then please do and we will try and help and see if there's a way forward in terms of um, products. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Joe, for that excellent uh, summary. Um, so what I'm going to do, I think we've got um, about five minutes before the break, yeah? Yeah? Yes. Yep. Um, so what I'm going to do is there are a number of questions and comments um, that have been typed in. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll I'll run through as many of them as I can. Um, and then um, uh, we've also realised that, well, A, there isn't time to answer them all and B, some of them uh, we just uh, haven't got the answer to hand. Um, so what we'll try to do also is is publish an answer um, to each of the questions on the, the website um, after the, the event. Um, so first of all, a comment, um, which is if we cannot control aphids with regular pesticides, um, then we have to come to a point where customers are going to have to accept some natural enemies as occasional contaminants in harvested products, two question marks and an exclamation mark. And that this is definitely something um, to cover in the, the breakout groups. Um, then um, there's a question about Neuroso plant points, so we'll address that um, separately. Uh, a question, is there any work being done on autumn into spring cover crops with regard to aphids? Um, I'm not aware of any, um, but again, um, we'll um, uh, reply um, with a, a sort of written response to that in case uh, others are aware of, of that. Um, then there are a number of questions and comments about the, the mineral oils and the trials. Um, and I think the best thing to do for those is to leave those to the breakout session um, on potatoes. Um, so one is, yeah, which researchers and which trials in which locations in 2020 are likely to gain approval for which products. Um, and yeah, some comments about that. Um, there, again, there's a question, uh, what can you tell us about BABA? Uh, B, um, amino butyric acid priming agent in plant signaling. Again, um, I, I don't know the answer to that, but we'll try and, and provide a written response. Um, and then a question, how does soil management affect soil microbiota and above ground interactions for improving aphids using biocontrol? Um, again, I think the answer to that might be um, pretty, pretty complicated. Um, so again, I think um, possibly um, a good idea to provide a written answer. Uh, then there's a question about the presence of hoverfly larvae in 
in produce um, in relation to the Californian uh, trials. And I think if that's OK, we'll leave that uh, to the Q&A session later on. Um, and then another comment, intraspecies variation can be caused by aphid infection with facultative bacterial endosymbionts, which can vary diverse range of fitness effects on their aphid host, including protection against parasitism, pathogens and altered life history parameters. What do we know about this? Um, so again, that's outside my area of expertise. Um, so again, we'll, we'll try to provide um, a, a written response. And indeed, if anybody listening into this would like to um, provide a response, then please let us know. And then another um, question about endosymbionts. Um, recent work has shown that endosymbionts in aphids can influence aphid probing and feeding behavior, increasing the frequency of cellular punctures into plant tissue and duration of flow and sap ingestion. Should this be further investigated to increase IPM knowledge? Um, and I guess the, the, um, the short answer to that is, is yes. Um, if if it is showing some promise. And again, if anybody's got a response to that, please type it in. Um, and then another comment um, about microbe induced resistance, um, saying that it appears to be strongly context dependent um, with reduced benefits under certain biotic and abiotic conditions and some crop varieties. And further, it's a challenge to deliver and ensure stable associations of beneficial microbes and plants and avoid undesired, undesired effects on beneficial insects. So how can we improve our understanding of MIR mechanisms and context dependency? And again, I think that's one that will um, warrant a written answer. Um, somebody suggesting that we should probably um, have included um, opinions from several agronomists. Um, uh, not just one per crop group. And certainly the breakout sessions are where we hope others will express their opinions as well. Um, and there will be notes taken there. Um, and again, somebody requesting that there should be a broader view from the industry. And again, an opportunity in the breakout systems and sessions. And also, obviously, we're going to have some industry talks um, after the break. Um, a question about the, the SEPTA plus um, pesticide natural enemies side effects database, how it will uh, differ from those already available from uh, biocontrol companies. I guess just to say that it is a, an independent um, database. A question about application for basis points, which we can answer outside. Um, and then a, a, a request to share, make public your list of emergency applications. Will that be feasible, Joe? Uh, yeah, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to do that. Excellent. Um, then a question about um, sulfoxaflor having a knockdown effect versus Flonicamid versus by myrotetramat. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, we're in some cases talking about coded products. Um, just to say that from the data I, I showed you at the beginning, all the coded products um, were pretty rapidly effective. Um, and then, and then a question about what are you looking at for pythium in vegetables, um, seed treatments in particular. I don't know, Joe, have you got a comment on that one? Um, we have got um, work ongoing that ADAS um, are doing for us, um, looking at um, Pythium and, and C treatment um, issues, aren't we, within the Sector Plus program? Yeah. OK, and another one for Joe. Um, are you looking at anything for neck rot in onions, seed treatments? And yeah, so Steve Roberts is doing some work on onion neck rot for us. Excellent. So um, I've got to the end of that list and I think we ought to take a break now. As I say, if anybody can respond to any of those questions, um, perhaps we should publish them, um, then um, please, please do so. Um, so we're now going to take a 10 minute break. So what time will we be back? Uh, at 12.
11.15. So back at 11.15. Um, and thank you for listening and thank you very much for your patience. Hello, everybody, and welcome back. And we're now going to go on to the, the session on bioprotectants. Um, so we've got four um, talks in this session. And what we're going to do is um, have all the talks first. So I'll introduce them one by one. Um, and then again, if you're on typing in questions, um, we can address those at the end of the, um, the session. So our first speaker is uh, my colleague Dave Chandler and Dave's a microbiologist and entomologist um, in the School of Life Sciences at Warwick University and uh, also a member of Warwick Crop Centre. Um, and Dave is going to talk about the AMBER project um, and then I think a bit about the, uh, the project on uh, partial host plant resistance that I mentioned earlier on. So over to you, Dave. Thanks, Rosemary. Um, I'll just open up. So can you everyone see that? Can someone, Rosemary, can you give me a thumbs up if you yes, can? Yes, see? I can yeah, see. you can. Thanks, okay, yeah. OK, brilliant. So yes, very quickly, I'm going to talk about uh, messages from two uh, projects, that uh, AMBER project on biopesticides and then the, the SARIC project on integrated biocontrol. So um, I'll start obviously logically with AMBER first and then I'll move on to the, the SARIC project which is also part funded by AHDB. Right, so AMBER is concerned with biopesticides on protected edible, protected ornamental and nature nest crops. And the work is done by us at Warwick Crop Centre, but also our colleagues at ADAS and Silso Spray Applications Unit. Um, and in these crop sectors that we're focusing on, biopesticide use is becoming more common, but it's important to remember that biopesticides are not the same as conventional pesticides and they're harder to use. So the aim of AMBA is to identify the reasons why biopesticides can be inconsistent in their usage and then develop generic management tools and practices that can improve performance. That is a real challenge because we're talking about the majority of biopesticides for a wide range of pests and diseases and crop types, but that's what we're addressing. I'll give you messages from two areas. The first is making spray application more efficient. And then the second one is about pest population modelling to inform application strategies for bioinsecticides. OK, this is the first one then on uh, spray application. And in essence, targeted precise spray application is absolutely vital for biopesticides because they're not forgiving if you like and if your spray application is poor if you're not on it then they are likely to fail and um, in particular the work that's been uh, centered around um, the people at Silso has shown that the water volumes being used are usually too high that's inefficient to apply and it leads to loss of product through runoff and really to get the best results out of biopesticides we need to control and optimize the water volume so you can get the highest concentration of biopesticide on the leaf surface now that is self-evident but um, many people in in the industry still believe that high water volumes are best because there's a perception that it gives better coverage and better penetration into the crop but the truth is actually far more complex so, so look at this graph this is a graph done at Silso on um, application of a tracer dye using a track sprayer to basil plants and it shows uh, the amount to, let's look at the blue line it's the amount of deposit applied against uh, water volume on the bottom and you can see that as you increase water volume you get an increase in the amount of deposit up to a certain point but then it starts to plateau out and that's because you're losing product because of runoff if you look at the red line here this is a normalized deposit so this is the amount of material applied per unit volume 
of water in essence is kind of the proportion that's uh, retained on the crop it's like the efficiency of spray application and that declines markedly with increased water volume so your kind of sweet spot in my opinion for application is around about here which marries up total deposit with efficiency um, so this is a recommendation from Silso about application of biopesticides on short crops like basil when you're using a horizontal boom. And here the amount of active substance deposited on the plant is sensitive to volume, as we've just seen. If the product applied at a constant dose, then the maximum active substance applied is given by the lowest water volume, providing that the maximum label concentration is not exceeded. Um, for products applied at a constant concentration, then the maximum volume is about a thousand litres per hectare. But on small plants, it's better to go for about 500 litres per hectare to reduce losses due to runoff. And uh, the label recommendations are often for much higher volumes. So we're given this message that lower volumes are more efficient and more effective. On tall crops like tomato and pepper where you've got a vertical boom then the amount of active substance deposited on the plant is actually relatively insensitive to volume and the reason is for that is to do with the complex leaf architecture and canopy structure of the crop we think um, so the recommendations from Silso for this is that for biopesticide products applied at a constant dose then you're better off choosing a low water volume to actually make the application more time efficient because it's quicker to apply. For products applied at a constant concentration, and Silso are saying that the maximum volume is about 1,000 litres per hectare, going up to about 1,500 litres per hectare. Remember, these are for vertical crops. So Silso have developed a calculator which is really useful so that converts the volume needed for the vertical crop the wall area into the volume applied for the floor area using information on the row spacing and the crop height and that ensures that the label recommendations which are based on the floor area basis are actually met this is data from an experiment we did with, with Silso uh, using a fungal biopesticide to control spider mite. And the spider mites were on tomato sprayed with a track sprayer using biopesticides at different water volumes, concentration of product. And now you can see that for different water volumes, uh, the spider mite control was similar there was some variation and our analysis kind of shows that control was best at about 500 litres per hectare so it illustrates the points that that we were making earlier um, and in essence this message about lower volumes is very important because they're more efficient they're quicker to apply providing that they can deliver a high product concentration to the target which in this case is a maximum concentration of spores per unit leaf area you can get to control the spider mites okay so that was a kind of a brief summary of some of the messages for spray application i'm going to talk about the pest population modeling work that we've done in amber um so with biopesticides they're not many of them are not like conventional pesticides because they don't have an instantaneous speed of kill so they take a bit of time to kill the pest and that means we have density dependence coming in in which the efficacy of the biopesticide is determined by a wide range of variables that are linked to pest population dynamics so i'm talking about things like the starting population size of the pest its age structure its fecundity, the natural mortality rate, and also the speed of kill of the biopesticide. These things are really important, but current strategies developed for using biopesticides 
don't take those variables into account. And historically, we think that many of the strategies have been developed on a trial and error basis, even though the variables I've talked about determine optimum timing, frequency and application dose. It's prohibitive to really test all the different options using crop scale experiments because they're expensive and time consuming. So we need a different approach. So the approach we've taken is to use modeling and uh, colleagues at AIDAS have developed what we call a boxcar train model of uh, pest development. So it informs biopesticide use strategy in IPM. It's been developed for whitefly, but also for mysis. Um, this is an illustration at the bottom of how it works for um, whitefly. And basically it tracks the maturation of individuals from different life stages, one to another. And um, basically the different life stages are represented by carriages in a railway train, if you like. And um, we can uh, know the development time for each life stage. We can impose things like mortality values on them because biopesticides can show differential um, effectiveness against different life stages. And we can apply variables such as persistence, natural mortality, speed of kill, frequency of application, those kind of things. This is a real game changer, I believe, for biopesticides. This is the output of a model simulation for the use of neem against Mises persici. And it shows the effect on days to eradication of the pest population using different application strategies. So a single application here, for example, and then two applications at day seven and day 14. And you can see from the data in the bar graph that actually this double application, um, seven days apart, day seven and 14, gives the, the, the best control option. And this actually bears out the experience that Tom Pope at Harper has achieved with Neem against Dafids on Pansy, for example. Um, this is just one illustration, but this modeling approach now allows us to test different application scenarios for biopesticides and actually use knowledge to kind of estimate what we think the most efficient application strategies will be rather than doing it on a, a suck and see basis. OK, so, so hopefully you get the idea of what we're doing in kind of generic tools in AMBA. Um, I am aware I'm going quickly, but there is a lot to talk about. Um, I'll briefly want to talk about the second project, which is funded by UKRI and it has industry partners, including BBRO and AHDB. And this ties in with what Rosemary was talking about earlier. This is a bar control strategy for Mises on Brassica, done by Warwick, Keel, Durham, Harper and ADAS working together. And we, the aim is to combine durable crop resistance with biocontrol using parasitoids and insect pathogenic fungi. So this is what we're doing. We are identifying partial resistance in Brassica to aphids. That's really important because it's durable. We're using molecular techniques to look at the gene expression responses of those pl uh, plant lines to identify markers, markers for our, our targeted uh, breeding. We are doing work on parasitoids and enhancing the activity of naturally occurring parasitoid populations using a volatile called cis jasmine. And then finally, we are looking at fungal biopesticides and identifying strains of fungi that kill adults and nymphs. That's really important because uh, the nymphs can shed the fungal spores, which make them less susceptible. And that's one of the reasons why some fungal biopesticides don't work on aphids, okay? So these are the results. Um, this is the screening work we did for uh, veg brassica lines from the gene bank, and they show uh, the median uh, level of resistance of different lines of brassicas to mysis. And we have lines of brassicas in which the median level of resistance, the median populations of aphids are about one third of the size of the most susceptibles. So if we can reduce 
aphid populations uh, to a third of their level uh, using durable resistance that will provide a really good platform for biocontrol. That was done in the lab, but we've shown that the selected lines um, in cage experiments at ADAS outdoors, the, the resistance shield still bears up outdoor environment. This work number three is work done at Harper that shows that the partial resistance is linked to reduced aphid growth. So this is a graph of relative growth rate, rates of aphids against accession number and the accession numbers map out with the resistance scale we have in our screening experiments. So uh, more resistant lines have lower growth. And then our molecular studies based at Durham have showed that the resistance is associated with delayed expression of jasmonic acid signaling pathways, which indicates to me that there is a constitutive resistance operating within the resistant lines. This is really exciting work now at Keele. This shows that cis jasmine, which can be applied to brassicas, uh, very significantly increases the foraging activity of uh, parasitoids. Just look at this graph here, um, this big graph for, for pak choy, but we've got other uh, brassicas on, on the bottom. And you can see that when cis jasmine is applied ahead of parasitoids being released, then the foraging activity is increased. Typically a fourfold, in, in this case, actually it's higher than that, um, increase, significant increase in foraging activity. That to me is really exciting. And then finally for SARIC, this is the work we're doing on fungal biopesticides. And this is a result of a, a lab bioassay in which we're comparing susceptibility of adults and nymphs. And here we've identified two lines is uh, actually one of these is commercially available lines of insect pathogenic fungi which kill aphid adults but also nymphs and that's very important because we have a product then that works against the nymphs with their uh, short intermolt period okay so so hopefully you get the idea with that and the key point is that this maps on exactly to what rosemary was talking about before so we have an IPM pyramid. So this is IPM for the future. Uh, the, the base level is durable resistance bred into commercial crops. We can enhance our uh, conservation bar control of parasitoids by adding cis jasmine. And then we can have a more effective biopesticide at, at the top. So that all maps on to the, uh, the IPM pyramid quite nicely, I think. And, and that's all I wanted to say. This is the, the team at Amber at the top and then the team at Sarek at the bottom. So I will uh, finish there and then um, hand back to you, Rosemary. Many thanks, Dave. That's great. Um, and I can see there's at least one question for you later. Um, so the next talk is by Miles Taylor. Um, and Miles is the technical development manager at Alpha Bio Control. And Miles is going to talk about Flipper. So, so over to you, Miles. Uh, thanks very much, Rosemary. Um, yeah, so the top line figure is that Flipper is a fully registered and approved contact acting biological insecticide with an extremely wide EMU in the UK, which means essentially if you grow a crop, then you can use this uh, highly effective product. It's marketed by Bayer Crop Science on an open distribution. Um, and uh, yeah, controversially, um, I think um, in my view, um, it is not harder to use than a, a conventional insecticide. So for a biological product, I think this is uh, really exciting. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the active ingredient in Flipper is unsaturated carboxylic acids. Mm -hmm. uh, these are compounds that are um, seen um, in the natural environment. Um, but what Alpha Bio has done is spent 10 years going through a stage of refinement 
to um, really understand what the best uh, ratio and balance of carboxylic acids are to achieve a product that is highly selective for crops and also for beneficials and uh, pollinating insects. So unlike um, paraffinic oils and other oil based products, um, it won't mask virus symptoms and it, um, it is extremely crop safe. Um, and, uh, and unlike other fatty acid based insecticides, the refinement process that we go through and um, the knowledge that we have of our um, raw material um, means that the product is a, is a relatively low dose and, uh, and, and it won't wipe out your, your beneficials. Um, we've done a lot of work which has uh, shown that um, beneficial insects when sprayed with the product will only suffer a, a very minor loss in numbers which shouldn't be uh, unacceptable um, to, to you guys out there and um, as we've been saying IPM programs are really um, but, uh, beneficial insects are a really core component of that so keeping those alive is, is really important. Um, the product is evaluated by the EU as being a food grade material so it's MRL testing exempt so um, and it has a zero day harvest interval so um, it has a really good place at the end of your spray programs for those of you who are concerned about residues. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, for those of you who are not so familiar with this active ingredient of carboxylic acids, um, carboxylic acids are a chemical family like any others, um, uh, and you can extract them from a range of animal and plant-based materials. And they come in lots of different types, um, like any other active ingredient family. Um, there are short chain carboxylic acids, which are used um, for um, controlling bacteria. There are medium chain carboxylic acids, uh, for example, pelagonic acid, which is used as a herbicide. Um, and then there's long chain carboxylic acids, which is um, which is where flipper is. And um, within this group of long chain carboxylic acids, you have a whole range of um, unsaturated carbon bonds. And this is where Alpha Bio has spent the last 10 years trying to refine um, which uh, unsaturated carbon bond positions are the ones that provide the efficacy without the um, crop um, damage that, uh, that you can see sometimes with these products. Um, yeah, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, the um, mode of action of uh, Flipper is um, that uh, when it's sprayed, it has to make contact with the insect, but it isn't a physically acting product. It penetrates through the exoskeleton of the insect and then it interferes with various metabolic uh, processes that are going on inside that sucking pest. So this means that as long as you get contact with the pest, then you're going to get good activity. And we've actually seen uh, that it's highly efficacious against a range of different pests. So from thrips, aphids, whitefly, scylla, um, we're getting really good experience from the marketplace um, that this product is effective on all these pests, as well as on several different pests. We have a lot of data which shows that it's effective against all uh, life cycle stages of the pest which explains why given it's only a contact acting product and it has a very very low persistence in the environment why it can have quite long lasting activity um, and as we move uh, the product through our uh, marketing and distribution partners Bayer um, we're learning all the time that, um, that it has uh, activity on all sorts of challenging pests that you would not expect it to. Uh, yeah next slide please. Um, yeah, this is just some excellent uh, electro micrographs um, that have been taken demonstrating the effect of flipper on an aphid. Um, as you can see, it's uh, within 24 hours, uh, it's uh, withdrawn its stylus and, uh, and it's completely desiccated. Uh, but just to reiterate that you're seeing here the uh, impact of the insect dying, um, it isn't a physically acting insecticide, but you can see, yeah, quite neatly how a 1% solution is affecting the pest. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, whilst flipper isn't hard to apply, um, it does uh, benefit from some um, 
uh, uh, some detail given to its application, I guess. Uh, so in particular, it's really important to use a high quality water with it. So waters that have um, extremely high amounts of um, cations, so things like calcium and magnesium, so really uh, very hard waters. Um, can have a negative effect on the efficacy of the product. So our advice in these situations is to use a non-acidifying water conditioner. Non-acidifying water conditioners have in the past been quite difficult to find, um, but Desangos have recently developed a water conditioner more or less for Flipper, um, and that's called uh, Exfusion. And uh, we, we recommend that if you are in an area with very hard water, so um, more than 400 parts per million that you use, um, that you use this product um, to restore uh, some quality to the water. Um, you can result in not just a slightly lower efficacy, but you can also end up with, um, with issues like blocked nozzles and things like that. So that's, um, that's about as tricky as the product gets. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, and, and I think reiterating um, one of the previous presenters, um, water volumes is also really important. Um, it's a, um, a premium product and you don't want to waste it, so it's really important not to apply too much um, and result in runoff. Equally, because it's a contact acting product, you, uh, you really want to make sure that you're using enough water volume to get, get coverage of the crop and the pest. And um, the work on the left is just showing you that as the water volume goes down, um, you do start to reduce mortality. And uh, and also, yeah, 400 liters of hectare um, in this work did look like the uh, like look like a good balance. Um, this uh, graph on the right is just again demonstrating that the only mode of action is contact acting. So when you spray flipper top and bottom, you get really good control of aphids close to 100%. If uh, the aphids are on the bottom of the leaf and you spray the top of the leaf, you get no control whatsoever. Um, and, uh, and then again, if you spray the bottom of the leaf with flipper, you get really good control. So um, this is just to reiterate when you use the product um, to be really aware where the pest that you're targeting is in the crop at the time of day, um, taking con into consideration environmental conditions. Um, so really good knowledge um, of your of your pest is is very important. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, um, application is really important. So we thought we'd just put in a slide just to talk about this specifically. The recommended rate is uh, is a one percent concentration so um, that's uh, something that you should maintain we do have data that shows that um, as you go below a one percent concentration then control does start to decline uh, but we haven't seen a huge uh, benefit of going from a one percent to a two percent concentration the um, improvement in efficacy is is not really justifiable unless you're using it for an enveloped pest like a woolly apple aphid or, um, or one of the other aphids that uh, that creates some kind of protection around themselves, in which case a 2% concentration uh, does make sense. Um, it's really important that the product is used at the first signs of infestation buildup. So don't wait until you have uh, a real problem on your hands because um, aphids tend to sit on top of each other and uh, you're not going to get control of those hidden hidden aphids if you're too late. Uh, yeah, so that's um, that's largely it. Um, it's just um, just also to say that in our data, um, we have something like 300 tr field trials on this product, and um, without fail, we see that uh, two applications of a one percent concentration in a seven-day interval is a is is a really good strategy. So make that first application, monitor your crop. If you still have a problem, then make that second application, and you uh, you you will get a good result. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, this is just some data that we've gathered um, uh, from IPM Impact on its uh, beneficial profile. So as you can see, um, it's uh, it's got a very kind profile for almost all of the major beneficial insects that you're likely to um, come into contact with. So um, when you're using it, um, this data was gathered on 
uh, insects that have been sprayed as opposed to exposed to the dried residue. So um, there will, yeah, in an IPM program, this is a, an excellent, an excellent product to be uh, to be using. Um, and um, yeah, we uh, we also do not have a restriction on our label to avoid use during flowering, uh, flowering because it uh, has a really good. Um, uh, profile for pollinating insects as well, uh, specifically bees. Uh, yeah, and I think that's probably my last slide. Yes, it is. OK, that's it. Brilliant. Many thanks indeed, Miles. Um, and I see there's at least one question for you, but we'll reserve that for the end. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move on to um, Ant Surridge. So Ant is Technical Development Specialist at Fargro um, and he develops new technologies for crop um, protection. So and Ant is going to talk about Naturalis and TechBomb. So over to you Ant. Yeah, I'm uh, hoping you can see my screen, Rosemary. Am I correct in thinking that? I can. Yes, well done. No technical difficulties, good stuff. Um, yeah, so my name's Ant Surridge. I'm a technical development specialist at Fargrow. For those of you who might not know Fargrow, we're a horticultural distributor based down on the south coast, but we market our national exclusive products like Naturalis and TechBomb right throughout the UK, so you should be able to get it through any of your uh, distributors. <coughs> so we start off with uh, Naturalis itself. It's a versatile bioinsecticide for the control of white fly and the reduction of frips. And those are the pests that are mentioned on the label, but we'll look slightly later on at how the mode of action means that it's got quite a broad range of efficacy across quite a wide range of different pests. So what is Naturalis itself? Um, well, Naturalis contains the insect pathogenic fungus Bavaria bassiana, a specific strain of which was isolated for its efficacy and consistency on quite a wide range of pests. So you can see the sort of unique mode of action in the pictures on the right hand side. You have the insects that have been infected and once the mycelium has grown within them, it sporulates out. Something that was mentioned earlier was around issues with consumers having um, macrobiological controls in their products when they get them. However, with uh, entomopathogenic funguses, once they're infected, although these pests in the pictures are on the leaf, generally they'll fall to the floor because they can't cling onto the leaf anymore. So it's another product with no chemical residues, so a great product to be used if you're trying to get a low residue or no residue crop. And it integrates very well into biocontrol programs and uh, IPM programs. Uh, so although it has quite a wide range of efficacy on a lot of pests, um, it has been selected as a specific strain because it doesn't have much effect on the macrobiological controls that you'd be using in conjunction with it. So just some quick headline facts on the trialist itself. So it's an oil dispersion formulation containing 7.16% Bavaria bassiana. Its approval in the UK is on all edible crops and uh, ornamental plant production, both in protected environments. So quite a wide range of crops, but still restricted within a protected environment in this case. Uh, the map numbers there, the max individual dose is three litres per hectare. Max number of treatments is five per crop and the latest time of application is not applicable. So again, a very nice product to be able to use right up to the point of harvest. So in terms of how the product itself actually works, so it's a contact acting entomopathogenic fungus. So there's the adherence of the canidia spores onto the cuticle of the insect. These spores then germinate and penetrate into the insect's body. They do this through a series of enzymes, penetration pegs and plates until they eventually reach into the hemolymph. Once within the hemolymph, the mycelium starts to feed on the nutrients within it, and then ultimately that will lead to dehydration and death of the insect. So generally the death of the insect will be at about three to five days after the application. However, the effects on activity of the insect will be instantaneously after infection. So once the spores have actually attached onto the cuticle and they start to penetrate in, you'll see the withdrawal of the stylet, a lack of activity from the pests. So the actual crop damage will stop sooner than the death of the pest occurs. So in terms of the range of activity, uh, there's good activity on all developmental stages of whitefly and lots of different types of whitefly. So uh, good on glasshouse, tobacco and honeysuckle whitefly 
if there is particularly high levels of infestation, it might be worthwhile thinking about going in with a product with a greater knockdown. So earlier was mentioned sulfoxaflor, so a product like Sequoia would be a good option to go in with first and then follow up with applications of naturalis if control is still needed later down the line. With regards to FRIPS, all mobile stages of FRIPS are controlled, but it's essential that you try and get that good level of coverage. So on a lot of the crops that we trialled on, such as cucumber, very high efficacy has been seen. But in some crops where the FRIPS are a bit more cryptic, it's difficult to get that direct contact onto the pest. So it might be worthwhile thinking about starting a treatment sequence to try and get good levels of control or integrating in with your biocontrol programme. In terms of spider mite, again, there's good efficacy across most stages of development, adult nymph and good oversidal activity. And again, good across the range of different pests. So within the spider mites, so spider mite, two spotted, carmine mite and tomato russet mite. Some of the external trials, the independent trials we've been running since the trialist has been approved as a product have shown particularly good activity against capsids. And then wider trials as well have shown good activity against aphids, caterpillar, leafhopper, shorefly and scarab fly. At the moment, the label is restricted to just mentioning whitefly and frips. Hopefully spider mite will come onto that soon as we've applied for that data package. But it's worth keeping in mind that with the wider trials that we've done, we have seen activities on a much wider range of pests. So in terms of the environment for activity, what's needed for this entomopathogenic fungus to thrive is uh, activity temperatures start at 10 degrees and then the upper threshold is 37. If you go below 10 degrees, that's not too much of an issue. When it warms up again, activity will start again. If you go above 37 degrees, you'll probably have issues with denaturing the fungus, but equally, hopefully you're not going above that temperature too often. The optimum temperature range is between 20 to 30 degrees. And then the uh, relative humidity above 60% relative humidity is when the product will start being really efficacious and above 80% is when you start getting that sporulation stage. So if you think back to the earlier images I showed when you had those white sporulating bodies coming out of the insect, if you want to achieve that, there needs to be above 80% relative humidity. But that's 80% relative humidity in the environment that Naturalis is working in. So within a sort of two millimetre um, radius of the leaf, there tends to be this microclimate that's created where humidity is higher, especially if you're in a cupped leaf and on the underside of the leaf or within the canopy, there does tend to be higher levels of humidity there. So that's often actually achievable in the field. In terms of the effects of sunlight, UV light can reduce viability. However, it is part of a, a formulated in an oil formulation, so that does offer some protection against UV light. However, it's still probably worthwhile thinking about when you're applying in the morning, in the evening, when UV lights are less. I think something that we've uh, heard today and we'll hear more of throughout the day is the importance of monitoring environmental conditions uh, for development of pests, but also efficacy of products. So on the right hand side of this page, I have a dashboard that's been created on Zenzi via 30 megahertz data, which is outlining different controls within an IPM program for FRIPS, so macrobiological controls and the trial cell, the optimum temperatures at which they work, and then a really easy visual format for growers to see in real time which products are going to work most effectively at a given time. So in terms of the application of the um, product Naturalis, it's very important to think about the equipment being clean and residue free. So it might be worthwhile looking at getting a biopesticide specific bit of kit. That is because if there are residues in the tank, there is a possibility that you may affect uh, the fungus itself. Before you measure out the trial cell, it's worthwhile gently rotating and inverting the bottle. If it's been sat in the same position for quite a while, you'll find that um, the actual uh, spores have settled out and the top bit will just be liquid. So invert the bottle a couple of times to ensure spore distribution. Make an initial solution of half the final water volume and again ensure that the spores within that mixture are well dispersed and then make up to the final volume. It's important also whilst you're out applying the products, if the application process is going to take a while, thinking about agitating. So ensuring that those spores are evenly distributed around the tank so that what's actually coming out the end of the nozzle is the correct concentration that you were thinking it was when you put it in. And again, because it's a oil formulation, a wetter is not normally required. So something that we often get questions about is spore activation. So there may be some benefit to activating the spores in terms of kickstarting the germination process. 
And if you were to want to do that, you'd measure out a small quantity of nitrolysel in water, about 300 mils and 10 litres of water, leave that for two to three hours to activate the spores and then apply the product. But it's very important if you are doing that to think about how long you're leaving it there for, because if you leave it too long, the spores can get soft and liable to damage when they're put through a high pressure situation, such as being sprayed out of a boom. So make sure you use that spray solution within five hours. So just a couple of quick um, points again on the application and spraying. Ideally, you want to use nitrolysel at the first sign of pest infestation, but it can be used as a corrective measure throughout any time of the growing season. However, it is contact. So if you do have issues actually contacting all of the aphid population, it's worthwhile maybe using a knockdown or another product to try and reduce down the numbers before you apply. In terms of type of spray, uh, again, sort of referring to what Dave mentioned earlier, it is very important to think about your specific situation and what's going to be the best way to apply with both thinking about canopy coverage, but also where the pest itself is going to be. Um, but generally, we advise as a fine spray to ensure complete coverage to just before runoff. Time of application, as mentioned, morning and evening is best because that's when adults fly less, relative humidity is higher, and also there's less issues with um, UV light potentially. And if you are looking at creating a spray program regularly with uh, Naturalis, the minimum interval between those sprays needs to be five days. So the label rate itself is at three litres per hectare and a thousand litres of water. However, as we've uh, previously mentioned, crops and growth stages require different levels of treatment. And there have been a lot of work done on the rate of uh, Naturalis that's used to give adequate um, uh, efficacy. So to reach efficacy and regulatory requirements, the following rates are what we recommend through trials. 1.5 litres per hectare if you're using it in 500 to 1,000 litres of water per hectare, 3 litres per hectare if you used um, anything above that 1,000 up to 2,000 litres a hectare. You don't really want to go above the water volume of uh, 2,000 litres per hectare because you'll do uh, dilute the solution below what is required. And if you do that, there are uh, issues with efficacy and it may require a lot of repeat applications or integration of other products. So in terms of uh, shelf life, Naturalis has a 12 month shelf life when stored at 20 degrees. However, uh, it's longer if stored at four to five degrees, which is how we have it stored here at Fargro. So it's always in our cold store. Once opened, uh, it needs to be stored at four to seven degrees. And again, as mentioned earlier, it integrates really well into an IPM program. It's been classified through independent trials as non-toxic, so less than 25% mortality to a range of different biological insects. I've just listed a few there, um, but it's still important even with um, that non-toxic rating to think about the gap you're gonna leave between the application of Naturalis and an application of new biocontrols. It's worthwhile leaving that two day gap just to be on the safer side. So further information on Naturalis or any of our national exclusive products, uh, give our technical team a call or visit the website to uh, download the technical notes, which will have details from various trials as well as some further technical information and our product manuals that sort of relay the messages on the label in a more readable format. Those are all available via the website. So the next product I'd like to talk about is TechBomb. So TechBomb is one that's newer to us than the Trialis, but it's uh, hard on whitefly and soft on plants. So what is it? It's a powerful biodegradable contact acting insecticide, and this is based on an exclusive selection of synapified vegetable oils from food grade sources. So this particular selection of vegetable oils has been selected through various trials to try and ensure a powerful contact act action on the pest but for it to be a soft soap, so gentle with the plants to help reduce the risk of uh, scorching issues. And in addition to that um, powerful contact action on the pest itself, there's also this really useful uh, wetting and cleansing effect that we'll touch on slightly later. So a couple of key facts on TechBomb. It's a soluble concentrate formulation containing potassium salts of fatty acids. The approval at the moment in the UK is permanently protected with full enclosure crops of tomato, aubergine, pepper and chilies. But if we throw back to about an hour ago, you will see that in um, some of Joe's slides, we're working hard at the moment to try and get emus to extend the range of use for this product. The map number is there. 
the maximum individual dose is seven litres per hectare, maximum number of treatments of three, and again, a product that can be used right up to the point of harvest, so really useful in a spray programme. In terms of the mode of action of Tech Bomb, powerful contact action, as I mentioned. So again, thinking about coverage is really important, thinking about levels of um, pest infestation or if they're cryptic where the pests, pests might be is really important in this uh, case. The product works by dissolving the exoskeleton of soft shelled insects by altering the structure of the cell membrane. So if you look at the pictures on the right, you can see a white fly one hour after the application and then a day after the application. So you can just see that the exoskeleton has been broken down and ultimately that's led to death by suffocation and dehydration. So again, although the actual death of the insect can take a while in terms of the activity on the pest, once they have been hit by um, a product like this, the stylet will retreat and the activity will go down considerably. So in terms of the range of activity, it is labelled at the moment for whitefly, but further trials from uh, the various countries around the EU that have the product and from the manufacturer themselves have shown really good activity on aphids, mites, scylla and some other soft bodied insects. Generally, if it's soft bodied and you can reach it and make good contact action, we think it will have a good level of efficacy. But again, we're working with the likes of AHDB as well as wider trials to really try and better understand what the efficacy profile of this is like. So as mentioned, there is this leaf washing action, which can be really useful in some protection of uh, foliar diseases. So this isn't something that we're going to be looking to target in the future, but it is worthwhile keeping in mind that this leaf washing action will detach any spores that might have landed on the leaves, which can give you a, a decreased risk of potentially getting any foliar diseases. And on that leaf washing point, again, that leaf washing action is really useful for these uh, sap feeding insects that are producing honeydew, ultimately leading to sooty molds. You can apply this product, wash it off the surface, reducing your risk of getting sooty moulds in the future. It's particularly important with any products that you're selling the leaves of. So a couple of points on mixing and spraying. Uh, Tech Bomb can be mixed with some other pesticides and we are working on our tank mix lists at the moment, which as mentioned earlier will be included in our technical notes available from the website. Um, but you do not mix this with uh, oil formulations, acidic products, products containing copper, sulfur, phosphite or phosphatile aluminium. It's an alkaline compound, hence not wanting to mix it with acidic products. Hardness of water can often be an issue for fatty acid based products. However, the reports we've had out of Spain and from the manufacturer are indicating this is not an issue at the moment and feedback from um, growers that we've had using the product, they haven't had issues yet either but we are still working again as a new product to better understand this. Similarly to the last product, it's very important to think about having a clean residue free tank. In this case, it's not because it will affect the fungus or product itself. It's because as a fatty acid product, it does have the potential to almost act as a tank cleaner and strip residues out the inside of the tank, which will then end up being applied to a crop, which can obviously be an issue with um, residues once you sell the product, but also potentially an issue of scorching if it forms around the leaf. Uh, so similarly, as mentioned earlier, it's very important that you get really good coverage of this product so that you can reach all parts of the plant. So that is um, my presentation pretty much summed up. My information is there, um, but visit the Fargo website and uh, do get in contact with us if you want any further details. I'll unshare my screen now. Excellent. Many thanks, Ant. Uh, right, so we just now move on to the last uh, presentation in this uh, session, um, which is by Harry Rayleigh. And Harry is a technical specialist for Certis Europe, and he's responsible for the north of England and Scotland. And he's going to talk about Botanigard and Spruce It. And I can see your slides, Harry, so that's great. So we're all, over we're to all you. Good. Hello, can you confirm that I'm live? Yes, you're live yeah. and your slides are good. Brilliant. Um, I'm Harry Rayleigh, a technical specialist at Certis Europe here in the UK. And we'll talk about Botanigard and Spruzit. So Botanigard is a microbiological insecticide uh, based on the entomopathogenic fungus Bavaria bassiana. Much like you'll find different varieties within cereal crops or 
different cultivars of particular flowers. It's the same with Bavaria bassiana. There are different strains of the fungus. Botanigard is unique in that it's made from the GHA strain. Uh, the GHA strain was chosen for its particularly aggressive characteristics. Now that strain of fungi is present as spores. Those spores are living microorganisms. In the wettable powder formulation, they're in a semi-dormant state. So with the slightest increase in humidity, they will start to germinate. Um, quick word about CFU. So you'll have spotted at the top of the screen there. CFU stands for colony forming units. It's a way of measuring the number of viable fungal cells or spores in a given sample. So it's, it's a way of quantifying products like Botanigard. Now Botanigard has 44 billion colony forming units per gram of product. That's 44 billion spores per gram. It's the highest concentration of any Bavaria product. This is important as we'll get to on the next slide. And every one of those 44 billion spores are going to count. When a pathogenic spore or when, when the pathogenic spores come into contact with susceptible insects, they germinate, they germinate on the cuticle and they continue to grow directly through the inner body of the host. On their way or on the way growing through the, the, the body of the host, they produce toxins and they, they absorb and drain the, the nutrients within the insect and ultimately kill it. And once the host is dead, uh, the fungus then grows back out through the softer parts of the cuticle uh, and it covers, the, covers the, the insect with a layer of this sort of white mold. Uh, and this is known as uh, white muscadine disease. And yeah, it's not nice. It's, uh, yeah, I certainly am glad I'm not an insect. So the various spores themselves are much larger than synthetic molecules. Um, you know, synthetic molecules in traditional pesticides probably a hundred times bigger than something like acetamaprid. And because of this large size, because of this large size of spore or molecule, whatever you, however you want to in interpret it, not only is that spray droplet size important for coverage, it's, it's important for efficacy. So we'll get to the, the, the maximum concentration of Botanigard is is so near the lethal dose required for effective control, again, more on that a little bit later, that, that if you have a small droplet with these large spore sizes compared to the, the, the traditional chemistry, if you have a small droplet, it drastically reduces the amount of spores carried and therefore the effectiveness of the droplet in a contact situation. Remember, this is contact insecticide. With systemic insecticides like acetamaprid or spirotetramat, this isn't the case. The amount of active ingredient molecules carried within the spray droplet is so much greater than required for lethal dose that when you combine that with systemic activity, the fact that the product's absorbed all over the leaf, molecule and spray droplet size have never really been part of the equation. Conventional chemistry is very forgiving. It, it really is. And it's, it's easy to use and it's versatile. Unfortunately, biopesticides lack that flexibility and they require much attention to detail. So let's look at an example. Um, I'm really going to build on and, and reiterate points that David raised in his presentation here. Um, and to be fair, uh, and let, let's have a bit of an example. So we'll have a, a hypothetical sprayer, right? That we're, that, that we're sort of going to pretend exists uh, and we're going we're gonna to walk through using it and, and filling it and using the product. So we've got this hypothetical sprayer and 
the first thing we're going to do is we're going to clean it out. We're going to clean the tank and the boom. Uh, we recommend all clear extra uh, as a good approach to doing that. And botanigard is a living organism. It's it's alive, and and you know it, it, it's it's in a semi dormant state when it's stored, but it's still alive. And the viability of the spores in botanigard can be greatly reduced when coming into contact with other pesticides. So it needs to be really clean, like really clean. Looking at botanigard label here, this is the most important thing, concentration. For so this example, uh, we're going to go with the maximum concentration rate of 62 and a half grams per 100 liters. So with our hypothetical spray we've got here, let's create a thousand liters of solutions. We've got a thousand liters of solution. Conventionally, you're going to be looking at these two columns. You're going to be looking at dose rate and water volume. With Botanigard, this, this isn't really the case. Max dose rate per hectare is not going to be the limiting factor uh, to efficacy. In theory, the limiting factor is going to be optimum coverage. It's going to be optimum coverage and spore loading. In most cases, you will exceed the optimum coverage before you come near to exceeding that maximum dose rate per hectare. And exceeding that optimum coverage is not going to do you any favors. For a contact bioarational like Botanigard to work effectively, the spray technique result needs to result in complete coverage and you know this is where the entire plant foliage is wet completely on all sides of the leaf as possible but without resulting in runoff remember it's contact only and you have to have it everywhere that the pest might be so large water volumes do not necessarily mean better crop coverage. When it comes to the actual water volume per hectare, like David has, has described, it's very dependent on the crop type, it's dependent on the crop growth stage, it's dependent on the environment the crop's grown in. It could be, it could be anything from 400 litres to 1,500 litres. It's that optimum coverage that we're aiming for. So let's focus on the leaf surface. And we've got that optimum coverage in mind. That, well, that's what we're aiming for. And you'll find the magic number is two. Two spray droplets per millimeter square on the leaf surface. That is when using a 100 micron nozzle, uh, sort of medium to fine 100 micron nozzles. So that's what you'll have got, two droplets per millimeter square. That's what you will have got if you've got the coverage right and you've got that water volume per hectare right. Three droplets per millimeter square would be near to runoff and one wouldn't deliver enough spores. So we know that the correct water volume for our crop, we're hopefully going to get two spray droplets per millimeter square. So what's the active ingredient loading? What is the amount of colony forming units that are going to be there to infect our target pest. So a maximum concentration rate of Botanigard, so that's 0.625 grams per litre, there will be 10 million spores per millilitre. And if you take that down to spray droplets, so that's per millilitre, if you take that down to spray droplets, at a, at a hundred micron droplet, 40 spores of Bavaria bassiana per droplet. So you can see why spore size and the high CFU content of Botanigard's WP, the wettable powder formulation, are so important. We've gone from 44 billion to 40, just like that. Just, you know, that's just, just from the start to the finish already. So two droplets containing 40 spores each is going to result in 80 spores per application of botanigard when applied at that optimum coverage 
And if we take uh, if we take glasshouse whitefly as an example, the lethal dose is deemed to be around 270 spores per millimeter square. So uh, this calculation that we've just done, that's looking at three applications, uh, five days apart, is going to give us a total of 240 spores per millimeter square. So we've gone from 44 billion to 40 spores per droplet to 240 spores per millimeter squared over three separate applications, five days apart, to get some sort of, of control. The next step would be, so this is, this is a hypothetical spray. We've been stood around talking now, so uh, yeah, we have to, it, it, to be fair, we ought to have cracked on, but uh, um, the next step would be, would be timing. So application timing. Now, Botanigard should be used as soon as the pest is detected. There is no time to be hanging around. Now, now that our spray solution is mixed up in this hypothetical sprayer, it is essential to use it immediately. The fungi spores are activated by humidity and moisture. So that's as soon as they're in the tank, basically. And also, there's no need for three hours of pre-activation per tank load or any of that. It's immediately, it's immediate with Botanigar. Relative humidity should be 70% or above. And it's a requirement you're going to see a lot with biorationals. And it's a requirement you'll see a lot with beneficial insects as well. And to be fair, it's not that hard a criteria to meet in, in an enclosed environment or outside. So you know when you can feel the air is really dry? Well, that's like, that's 40, 50% relative humidity. And then when you're on holiday in East Asia and the monsoon's coming in, that's, that's like 90% humidity territory. So temperature. Temperature is also important for spore germination to get them going and spore growth. So look here how rapidly spore growth speeds up as the temperature rises and how it tails off even sharper rate when things get too hot. So there's the sweet spot. That is the sweet spot you want to be aiming for. Now, unfortunately, like me, as you might be able to see, I don't know what the light's like, but, but like me, Bavaria Bastiana spores get sunburn. So UV radiation in sunlight, it can deactivate the spores and it slows the, the spore germ germination and growth. I know I said to, to use Botanigard as soon as the pest is detected. Well, if you could hang around until the evening, then you're going to see a bigger impact, a, you know, out of the midday sun. And to, to get that impact, um, Oh, crikey, it looks like we're running out of time by the you, sound of it. You are, Harry, yes. Is there, uh, uh, so yeah. we'll just, w w let me finish with, with the town, if that's all right. And um, so, uh, it's also, uh, um, right, we've got, uh, you know, we've got all of those environmental uh, sort of variables sorted. We've got the, the tank load sprayed and uh, we've put the, the remainder of Botanigard back in a sealed container and back in the pesticide store. And uh, unlike some products, Botanigard doesn't need to be kept in the fridge. Um, so when we get back to uh, the interval, so we've got three sprays to do. And this is very dependent on the dynamics of the pest population, the, the ratio of life cycles. Uh, and, you know, the higher number of larvae, the shorter intervals. And it's going to be sort of five days in most cases, seven days might be adequate in others. And here you can see the Tanagard is most effective against uh, aphids at maturity as, as adults. And as I mentioned earlier, the lethal dose graph here um, shows the maximum concentration is very close to, to the LD94 Midas per um, Just remember though, aphids are on the label for a, a pest for botanica, they are off label only. And with this fungi mode of action, there is very little chance of resistance developing. Plus that, that lowish max concentration value gives the best chance of beneficial insect populations to build up. It, it is after all a fine balance.
and Bavaria Bastiana won't be the quickest insecticide you've used. Lethal time trials for, for, for adult mitis persicates stand around that 4.6 days plus. And yeah, it's um, breaking that life cycle is, is, is going to be the key. And paired with other uh, effective biorationals like Eradicote uh, and Majestic, that's how IPM strategies can be formed. Um, thanks again go to David Chandler, Jude Benison, plus everyone else involved uh, that I haven't got time to mention. Now, I would like to continue and, and talk about Spruzit. Um I just want to check with the event organizers what the situation is. Hello, Harry. Um, I'm afraid I think we've run out of time now. Um, so I think we probably ought to stop if that's OK with you. OK. So thank you very much. OK. Um, so thank you um, to all the speakers in this session, Dave, Miles, Ant and Harry. Um, we have got some great questions and I've published them all, um, but we haven't got time to go through them now. Um, so again, um, what we'll do is, is ask the speakers uh, to provide some written answers. I say thank you, there are some really good questions. Um, so now we're going to take a 10 minute break. So it's 12.20 on uh, my laptop, so if we can be back Back at 12.30, please. Thank you. Hello again, everybody, um, and welcome to the next session. Um, just before we start that, just to say um, to Harry, uh, really sorry um, that we had to interrupt you. And uh, we're going to suggest to you that you do a, um, a PowerPoint with a voiceover um, about Spruce It, and then we can put that on the, the website. Um, so you can let us know later if that's OK. Um, so in this session, we're going to cover uh, some other uh, pest management options. So um, we're going to talk mainly about exclusion, resistance management and building IPM programs. Um, there was just a, a short slot um, for any uh, questions about the intercropping video. Um, and there was one. Um, from, from Andy Richardson, um, and I will just respond to that. Um, and basically, it was um, about hoverfly larvae being a major source of contamination um, in crops and often worse than the aphids, um, and how he was intrigued as to why there was no mention of contamination um, in the, the video. And uh, I actually um, anticipated that question. Um, and contacted Eric Brennan and he said um, we don't generally worry about hoverfly larvae and lettuce. Um, he finds them but most people don't um, and they're generally washed out when the le lettuce are washed so we shouldn't worry. Um, so I'm not quite sure um, that would be the approach in the UK um, but yeah a point for discussion later on. Right, so now we're going to move on to um, a session about exclusion netting um, and that is going to be led by Anne Stone, Knowledge Transfer Manager, uh, AHD Potatoes and, and Alan Frost from Agriland. So over to you, Anne. Good afternoon. Physical exclusion provides effective control of many pests. Could this be the case with aphids? In this session, we're thinking especially of virus transmission in seed potatoes, but also other crops. Alan Frost of Agrilan has interesting experience and I'll hand over to him. Alan. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Right. Um, are you putting slides up for me? Hello? Yes, Hello? can you see can you see the slides? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. Um I don't know whether I can 
control them, but it probably doesn't matter too much. I've only got a few minutes, so uh, I'll tell, start now. Tell, right. tell me when to move them. Right. Do I start talking now? Please. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm talking mainly about EnviroMesh, which is the original um, netted crop cover for, for crops, which originally started with a, a 1.35 meter mesh. And this was mainly used against um, cabbage root fly and other sizable pests. Um, and also on um, carrots with carrot fly, yeah. The use of nets over these crops worked extremely well and there was no problems with it at all. When we came to aphids, there was a bit of a problem in that as aphids fly above the crop, and then they look down looking for a suitable target. The mesh, as long as it was not taut, acted as a, a camouflage, is a pro possibly the best way to describe it. Um, but where the crop grew and pushed up so the mesh was taut, aphids could get through. Um, we have, under these circumstances, always recommended that one use enough mesh to allow slack. This particularly happened at the edge of the crops covered. Um, so leaving an extra meter of loose mesh at either side of the crop, either side of the crop prevented this problem. So for on, on potatoes, um, I think a meter is probably sufficient. Um, the, the other thing is I think monitoring within the crop is also very good. Um, and we many years ago, when we were monitoring aphids in cereal crops, we actually used yellow sticky traps, but you mustn't use them vertically because they don't work. You have to use them horizontally. So what we did was create um, like a bird table near the crop and you laid a horizontal sticky track on the top of it, which caught aphids. Um, I know that normally um, w yellow water traps are used, but they are possibly less convenient to use for growers who are trying to uh, monitoring in their own fields, in their own crops. Um, the, the other thing that we did do, on, well, this was quite a while ago and it's on the paper that's presented in here, is actually applying sprays through um, the nets um, on potatoes. This is particularly important for things like blight controls. Uh, and the, the original work showed that you either upped the spray volume to very high levels, um, six plus hundred litres per hectare, or you used air assisted sprayers and air assisted sprayers you could get good penetration at the st more standard rates of 200 litres per hectare. Um, I think in the because of the the short time and the brevity and I think I will leave it there um, I'm open to questions as and when you want to, and you can contact us um, through the details which Anne has available. So can I leave it there for now? Uh, thank you, Alan.
And at this point, Ian Campbell of Crop Solutions had hoped to present, but sent information instead because COVID has put such pressure on his business. Crop Solutions mainly supply fleece and 1.3 millimetre mesh. 15 years ago, they conducted trials of different mesh sizes against aphids and the results were not as expected with more aphids found on the swede under the mesh than in exposed plots. They thought the aphids may have been present before the mesh was laid, but it was disconcerting and other projects prevented a repeat of that work. Later in New Zealand trials, aphids were also found under the mesh and in this case they recognised that they had dropped through, they were entering as nymphs. In spite of these setbacks, organic brassica growers use crop solutions 0.6 millimetre mesh successfully and Ian thinks that with more effort they will find a way to keep aphids off seed potatoes to ensure that they're virus free. In work specifically on seed potatoes, Kupkra looked at the crisping variety VR808 in 2014. They used a mesh illustrated here on lettuce from Capitex. It's knitted so the structure is quite different from that of Agrolan or Enviromesh and stretching it in either direction greatly changes the aperture size, which was two millimetre in places in this experiment. In their usual thorough way, David Furman and his Cupgra colleagues had six replicates of each treatment and used infector strips, which ensured a strong virus challenge. Potatoes under the mesh developed more ground cover and grew taller than those outside, as can be seen in this graph. But perhaps to, to our surprise, uh, there was no difference in yield and all the components of yield were unaffected by the netting. 95% of tubers in the exposed plots tested positive for PVY, but still 9% of tubers from under protection tested positive. The Cupgra authors point out that 9% PVY is unacceptable in seed and that netting can't be expected to totally prevent transmission. My own view is that with less strong aphid and virus pressure and a more appropriate type of mesh, there's potential for better results. In 2015, a group of Scottish pre-basic seed potato growers visited Jutland in Denmark they saw that all PB1 crops were protected from virus by mesh. And the growers they spoke to said it worked. Their main problem was control of blight under the mesh, which required spray applications to be modified, as Alan Frost also pointed out. And I hear that in many countries today, mesh is used to protect high value early generation potato seed crops from aphid borne virus. Now, do we have a chance for questions? Um, I don't think we've got any questions. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so, yeah, I don't I can't see any questions um, that have been typed in uh, on the 
um, the covers. Um, but please uh, do send in any questions or comments. Um, and as I say, we will address them um, in writing later on. Right, so we're now going to change uh, track um, slightly and um, Steve Foster is going to talk about insecticide resistance monitoring and managing management. Steve is a research entomologist at Rothamsted Research um, and he currently works on insecticide resistance in crop pests, including the aphids, beetles, weevils, thrips and moths. Right, so I can see your slides, Steve. Um, so over to you. Can you hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you as well. OK, uh, thanks to AHDB for the opportunity to speak today. And actually, personally, also uh, thanks for the one hour delay because it allowed me to clean my kitchen and empty the dishwasher. OK, next slide, please. So just to start off, uh, there's a list of uh, aphids here with uh, importance of, of uh, virus transmission, in this case, potato virus yellows. And you can see that the chief uh, culprit is uh, thought to be Mitis persicae. So I thought I'd start with that species. It's uh, an old enemy of mine or friend, depending on which way you look at it. Next slide, please. So what we've been doing over the years is uh, at Rothamsted receiving live samples of Mitis collected from field, open fields and protected environments like uh, glass houses and polytunnels. And uh, we've been screening them for their response to a range of insecticides that were, were or are still available for use uh, uh, to control this particular pest. And you can see actually here a picture where you've got different colours. Um, it comes in different uh, colours, a bit like Smarties. Unfortunately, red doesn't equate to resistance, which would save a whole lot of time. But there you go. Next slide, please. So let's start off with a uh, tests that we've been doing uh, for the response to the neonicotinoids. Next slide, please. And here we can see uh, a histogram showing the response over the years going back to 2004 when we first started looking at this particular uh, compounds. Um, and uh, the y-axis shows the percentage of samples that in this case showed uh, the frequency of aphids that would carry what we consider to be low level resistance to neonics. And I stress low level in that it shouldn't compromise the neonics if they're applied at uh, recommended rates. And interestingly, if you go all the way along to the right, you can see in the last two years, we haven't found any of these forms in the samples that we've been testing. So that's good news. The, other, the main good news is that we haven't found what we consider to be higher forms of resistance. Those are the called NIC R plus and NIC R plus um, plus. Next slide, please. Um, and you can divide uh, the samples or the responses up into four categories. Those that we consider to be fully susceptible, those that have this low resistance that I just mentioned, those that carry moderate resistance and those that carry strong resistance, which is associated primarily with a target site mutation, which changes the structure of the target site of the neonex. Next slide, please. Um, and this figure uh, or map shows where we found these highly resistant NIC R++ forms. Initially, they were seen in uh, peach uh, and nectarines in uh, Spain and southern France. It was then seen in, in Greece, more recently in Tunisia. And actually, initially, we thought, well, yes, these forms actually are based all the way around the countries around the Mediterranean basin, but weren't moving further north or being found further north. However, recently, uh, these highly resistant neonic forms have been found on sugar beet in Belgium. And if you look at the map, of course, that's just across the, the water from where we are, essentially. So they're getting close. But as yet, we haven't seen them um, in this country. Next slide, please. Right, as you all probably know, uh, EU legislation has banned, has led to the banning of uh, neonic seed treatments on all outdoor crops in the UK. So we're talking imidacloprid, thymethoxam and clothianidin have all been banned as seed treatments on those crops. This is leaving acetamiprid as a spray and also thiocloprid up until recently. However, um, that has been lost as well on a lot of crops. Uh, there was an emergency registration uh, on sugar beet, I think, this year as a consequence of the loss of the neonic seed treatments, which are very, very important in that crop. 
what I will say about this uh, legislation or banning, it's 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 a disaster when it's coming when it comes to controlling uh, this species and indeed other species on uh, in the open fields. For example, sugar beets and cereals had, had used these seed treatments and they were working very well in protecting the crops, protecting them from virus transmission. Uh, Mark Stevens at BBRO has told me that this year has been a complete nightmare when it comes to virus yellows on sugar beets. So really the loss of these firstly is, is bad news for controlling the pest. It's also bad news for resistance management because it's meant that growers are falling back on other compounds that are still allowed. And in a lot of cases, this, these are the pyrethroid insecticides and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Next slide please. So let's go through uh, some of the compounds that uh, I've been testing or screening the samples with. Firstly let's focus on pymetrazine um, which um, is a compound, next slide please, which unfortunately has now been lost uh, a, a consequence of not being re-registered um, and the, this is particularly bad news as that you can see the evidence of the uh, testing that has been done over the years, I found no evidence of any reduced sensitivity which may be the precursor to higher levels of resistance or indeed control busting resistance. It's also uh, uh, not good news because pymetrazine is, is particularly benign when it comes to the beneficials, it's kind to your beneficials unlike the pyrethroid insecticides. Next slide please. So let's go through the other compounds. Flonicamid, which is uh, remaining as a, as a treatment on uh, sugar beet and other, and other crops. Good news is no evidence of reduced sensitivity or resistance. So that compound at the moment should work very well against Mises persicae. Next slide, please. Spirotetramat, same story. Um, all the bioassays that have been performed have shown no evidence of reduced sensitivity or resistance compared to what we consider to be a susceptible baseline. Next slide, please. Um, we've done some testing with cyanotronilaprol, uh, Benevia, uh, which is the diamide insecticide. It's not aimed directly at Mises persicae, but Mises could be exposed by being on brassicas. So basically any sample that's come in on a brassica crop we've tested. And the good news is we haven't found any evidence of reduced sensitivity or resistance to this compound. Next slide, please. Equally for sulfoxaflor, um, it has the same target size neonex, but it is considered to be a different compound with a different mode of action. And the good news is no evidence of reduced sensitivity or resistance in Mises persicae. Next slide, please. The bad news is, and as I mentioned about pyrethroids and growers tending to fall back on the pyrethroids, not only for aphid control, but for other uh, pests such as cabbage stem flea beetles, initially diamondback moths, onion thrips, we're seeing resistance. The more we look for resistance in these pests to pyrethroids, we more, the more we find it. And we have very strong resistance to pyrethroids in Mises persicae. Next slide, please. OK, so not only we've we been screening with these compounds in live bioassays, we've also been using uh, molecular assays that have been designed to look for uh, known resistance mechanisms. In this case, MACE resistance, which confers uh, target site resistance to Primacarp, which is another compound which has been lost, but we've continued looking for it just to see if there's any change in frequency. KDR, which gives moderate resistance, and Super KDR, Super Knockdown Resistance, the clues in the name, gives strong resistance. Next slide, please. Now, this is a little bit busy. We're going all the way back to 96, but you can see quite clearly the, the pros and cons of, of, of uh, monitoring showing ups and downs, a, a roller coaster ride. And in, in indeed, we first saw mace resistance back in 96 in Mises on uh, potatoes. It fell away and, that, and then came back. And, as, and now it's really quite common. KDR initially was quite common, fell away, but it's having a resurgence. And also the super KDR. And I mentioned that uh, this, uh, this uh, new mechanism we discovered, we found it in 2012. A bit of serendipity, I won't go into details, but it's one of those penicillin moments. We discovered it, we didn't know it existed before. My colleague Martin Williamson designed a probe for it and we've been testing for it ever since. And you see quite clearly this backs up the uh, the bioassay data and that we that mechanism is, is very common in the UK population and hence Primacarp, uh, hence pyrethroids will not work well against this species. And I think the fact that mace resistance is still around is because it tends to be found in what we call super clones um, and it's hitchhiking on the back of in those clones of, of those can super KDR. And I illustrate this with the next slide, please. 
um, Star Wars Attack of the Clones. Essentially, like, we have clones in the uh, Mises population. Next, uh, next slide, please. We call them super clones because essentially they're genetic, ident genetically identical individuals that originated from one individual in the past, and there are now millions, nay on probably billions of these uh, forms, at least in the UK and Northern Europe. And these super clones tend to carry MACE and super KDR. So that's what we're up against when it comes to controlling these pests. They're well designed for life in temperate regions. Um, and they carry resistance, in this case, to uh, strong resistance to pyrethroids. Next slide, please. I'll just uh, a couple of slides here just to illustrate my concerns about uh, the environments and where aphids might be coming from or coming into the country. Next slide, please. So I, I did um, a comparison of what I consider to be rarer resistance genotypes. Those that carry high levels of something called esterase resistance, or those are the homozygote for, for the other mechanisms, the target sites. And you can see quite clearly that these, the frequency of these rarer types is much lower from the open field compared to the protected environments. And I think this is because in the protected environments, these forms are coming in on uh, imported plant material. They're coming in from sexual populations and maybe places where these resistance mechanisms such as neonics are evolving and they're coming into the country. As I said, as so far we've seen no evidence of any strong neonic resistance, which if the seed treatments were still around would be very good news. Of course, they've been lost, but we still have the acetamiprid spray and thioclopid sprays and emergency registration. But I'm just illustrating here, protected environments I think are particularly important for the uh, immigration of uh, resistance forms from abroad. Next slide, please. Um, just moving on now to testing for, in this case, turnip yellows. Um, again, my colleague Martin Williamson designed a molecular test with not only within uh, suction trapped Mises persky, you can test for resistance, the molecular me mechanisms or target site resistance. You can also look for the presence of turnip yellows. And this was done in samples from uh, three Scottish uh, traps and also uh, one from York um, a few years ago now. But you can see quite clearly that in, in, in some years, very, very common high levels of, of, of frequency of this particular virus. And more recently, BBRO, BBRO have been doing testing as well. So they, they've shown that it's still around. So we've got high levels of turnip yellows, which of course is bad news for the loss of the neonics on sugar beets and, and on all seed grape. Next slide, please. Uh, moving on to willow carrot aphid. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, a dose response line. So essentially, I, I got a, a sample or a clone from Ferro back uh, that was collected back in 2014. I was hoping it was going to show a susceptible baseline, which would move these blue um, points further to the left. But as you can see, and at a field rate, or what we consider to be an equivalent field rate, because this is a topical assay in glass vials, so it's not a, absolutely equivalent to what happens in the field. There are individuals that appear to be OK and able uh, to, to move in a coordinated way. Um, next slide, please. Here we can see samples that have been brought in uh, or sent to us over the years, 2018 and 2019, and they sit very nicely on top of that initial uh, sample, suggesting that out there there's no variation and there's, there's evidence here that there are resistant forms. Um, next slide, please. And again, next slide, please. Here we can see um, the best comparison I can do at the moment is comparing to susceptible baselines for two other aphid species using this bioassay technique. And you can see this shifted to the left. So there's something about willow carrot aphids. They do appear to carry greater resistance to what we, we would consider to be a susceptible baseline. And I think this, this equates with reports of problems with controlling willow carrot aphids with pyrethroids um, uh, in the UK. Next slide, please. Um, just moving on to um, a few final aphids. So current less is aphid. Next slide, please. Um, again, we found resistance to pyrethroids, so uh, they shouldn't. They probably won't work against this species, particularly on on lettuce, um, and reduce sensitivity to spirotetrarch. I've, I've given a, a question mark here because there's some evidence there might be something going on with this particular compound. And it doesn't, at this stage, I think, confer control busting resistance, but there's something in possibly the first step in the evolution. And again, I'd, I'd welcome any comments from you of whether your experience that spirotetramat isn't working as well as it used to against uh, Nasanovia ribis nigri. Next slide, please. 
So just to finish off, uh, we'll go th uh, through the grain aphids. Their co the concerns, of course, now with the loss of the neonic seed treatments on cereals and the fact that they transmit um, cereal viruses. Next slide, please. So grain aphid, we know this pyrethroid resistance, again associated with KDR, so moderate resistance, not super KDR resistance. Uh, we've got the bird cherry oat aphid, where, which we think is the main vector of BYDV, PAV and MAV forms, and the rose grain aphid, and all three are capable of transmitting BYDV, although we think bird cherry is the main player. Next slide, please. So here's another dose response line. Here we do have a susceptible baseline, the open circles, and we also have a line which is the clone that carries this resistance, this moderate resistance in the heterozygous form to KDR resistance to pyrethroids. And what I do when I receive a sample, essentially I just compare the response to these two lines. Next slide, please. And you see quite clearly in this case, in this sample, it sits very nicely on top of the KDR. No evidence of any shift to the right. There's the same level of resistance that KDR moderate resistance is that would confer. Now, it's on the edge of field uh, efficacy of, of, of at, at the field rate, I think. As I said, although we try and get an equivalent uh, line or, or, or arrow, I think if you spray and you get good contact, you've probably still got good control at this stage. Next slide, please. And here is another sample from, and in this case from 2019. Next slide, please. And that sits very nicely on top of the susceptible. So quite clearly, there's not resistance is not fixed out there. There are aphids out there that would be very well controlled by a pyrethroid spray. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, uh, next slide, sorry, uh, on top. Thank you. And finally, we've got an intermediate response here. This is possibly uh, a clone that carries metabolic resistance that confers lower level resistance to KDR but um, it, 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 it's still not shifted to the other side of the lilac. I would have concerns if I found any samples that were coming further to the right. Next slide, please. And like in Mises Persky, uh, the clone that carries KDR, it carries it in the heterozygous form, so only one allele has it, is, is a super clone. So every time pretty much we've looked at the aphids that carry that are resistant they are this one clone this one super kdr clone we've never ever seen a homozygote out of the thousands of aphids that we've, we've uh, tested so that's interesting why homozygotes are out there it could be a fitness cost i don't know next slide please uh, just to finish off we've got a baseline in this case susceptible baseline for paid eye next slide please and this is a sample that again was shifted very slightly to the right. I don't think there's any reason at this stage for great concern. I would consider this to be reduced sensitivity. Next slide, please. And as a consequence of that, um, AHDB uh, 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 funded a project uh, that involves ADAS and Rothamsted to test uh, Cytobium vini and R. Paidi for their response to get a contemporary view in 2020. And we're, I'm currently collating those data, but we are looking to see if there's any evidence of increased resistance, particularly in our paid eye that might be equivalent to Cytobin Ravini KDR. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, we, I, we do have a baseline for uh, uh, Metaplophum Dirodum. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. And the good news is the two samples that we have looked at sit very nicely on top of, top of the baseline. No evidence of any shift to the right, which would indicate reduced sensitivity or resistance. Next slide, please. So finally, a few slides here about um, testing for virus, uh, BYDV and, 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 and also serial dwarf virus. And out of the uh, over a thousand aphids that have been tested by my colleague uh, from suction traps this year, uh, you can see uh, about 30% carried um, either one or the other. So it, it's quite a high level of virus and reason for concern. And hopefully this testing will continue and we'll see how things change over the over the seasons or years. But again, the loss of the neonic seed treatment on cereals, I think, is a major drawback and will lead to greater levels of, of virus. Next slide, please. And just to finish off, um, Increased pyrethroid spraying, which is happening as a consequence of the loss of uh, diversity of compounds, including the neonic seed treatments, will have a negative effect on beneficials. And I, I, I don't want to teach my grandmother to suck eggs here, but beneficial insect, insects such as parasitoid wasps, hoverflies and ladybirds can obviously control the pests for you and pyrethroid sprays will kill them. So avoid unnecessary pyrethroid applications such as adding to tank mi mixes when applying other treatments 
Uh, and, and also part of the problem is pyrethroids are very cheap, so they are easy to use because there's not a huge impact on, on, on costs. If you do spray, make sure it's in response to pest pressure immigration into the crop and stick please to the full rate. Do not reduce the recommended dose as this could lead to the evolution of control busting resistance. Next slide please. So just to finish, I, I've said this before, but I'd love to have a time machine, travel 5, 10, 15 years into the future and see where, where we are you know, with the loss of the seed treatments and, and the, the greater reliance on IPM, which has been talked about a lot today. Next slide, please. But I do suspect, at least in the near future, we'll see more and more of these scenes of, in this case, um, barley yellow dwarf virus on cereals because of the fact that we don't have the ability to control um, with, with, with the remaining compounds, including pyrethroids. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Steve, for a very comprehensive talk. Um, I think we've got a couple of minutes um, and there are a few questions. Okay. Um, so the first one is, is there an England-Scotland divide in resistance to pyrethroids for misers? Not that we know of in my misers. No, unfortunately, the ones up north are pretty much the same genotypes carrying super KDR primarily as the ones in England. There is a north-south divide for cabbage stem flea beetles carrying pyrethroid resistance, but that not, that's gone, not going to help the seed potato growers, I'm afraid. Excellent. And then another one, um, have the origin points for the resistant aphids been identified and has their movement been tracked globally? Uh, like mm -hmm. I assume, Yes, it's a good question. We think actually there are certain countries where these resistance mechanisms tend to evolve. And in the case of mace and uh, neonicotinoid target site resistance, it was in southern European countries where the populations are more sexual. There's more mixing of genotypes. And um, I'm adverse to say this, where maybe the spraying is a little bit more than it should be, and hence the selection pressures are greater. I haven't actually known of any data where you can actually see very closely how things are moving. The only way I, I've seen things is it's where the countries have been, in this case, have been reporting neonic resistance, and it's been, you know, initially in the, <coughs> the Mediterranean basin and then further north. That's as far as it goes. Although there are suction traps in Europe that where you, you can test for resistance. Excellent. And the last one, um, which is a, more of a comment really from Jonathan Blackman, um, he doesn't think that spirotetramat is working as well on dams and hop aphid as it did when first used, um, but always difficult to tell because the product really does depend on weather conditions and not good if soils are dry. Yeah, that is that is one species of aphid actually I've never worked with, although I know it has evolved resistance to pyrethroids. So it is it is a species that it is adept at evolving resistance or can evolve resistance. It's an interesting finding, um, and but inevitably, the more you use a compound, I think the greater the selection pressure. But yes, as, as, as Jonathan says, it can depend on weather conditions and how you apply as well. That That's important. Fantastic. So many thanks again, Steve. Um, and now we better move on. Um, so our last speaker um, before the breakout sessions this morning is Rob Jacobson and Rob's going to um, talk about building an IPM program using protected peppers as an example and Rob um, specializes in IPM for grasshouse crops focusing focusing on strengthening wheat links in existing programs for high input protected vine crops and developing new IPM strategies for lower input crops such as leafy salads. Um, so, are you ready to roll, Rob? I sincerely hope so. Great. Well, we can see your slides. So, uh, over well, that's to you. A good, that's a good start. Yeah. So, uh, okay. We'll take it from there. Brilliant. Well, I, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Rob Jacobson. Um, I have to say I've been involved in this subject for well over 30 years now, and I've been an independent consultant for well, over 16 years, worked with contracts in many different countries around the world. I'm really quite passionate about this subject and I could speak about it all day, but as I've only got a 20 minute slot, I'd better crack on. So I've been asked to talk about the factors to take into account, into consideration when building IPM programmes. And I've also been asked to base this on my own experience with aphids in protected peppers. 
So first we better have a little brief introduction to our pepper crops. Um, these are high value long season crops, generally put into the production house in December or early January. Um, usually come into production in sometime in March and then harvesting is continuous through the entire season until the crop is terminated around about now actually so it's virtually a 12 month of the year crop. Now I really want to stress at this point that we do have excellent IPM programs in peppers and we have had for some considerable time but what I need to do today is to describe the difficulties that we've overcome to, to reach this, this point. OK, well, the glasshouse environment is ideal for, for pests and there are over 20 species that can attack our crops. Just a quick look there at the range of insects and mites that we might have to deal with. And uh, although there isn't time to talk about them in individually today, I think you can see at a glance uh, the, the complexity of this. And we may be combating six to eight species simultaneously. As I go through this presentation, I'm, I'm going to flag up key points which I'll then pull together at the end as by way of a summary. So my first key point, bearing in mind what, I'm, uh, what I've just said about the, the number of species we might be dealing with, is that we must have compatible control measures for every pest at the outset. You can't go into an IPM programme with excellent IPM measures against one pest but not, and then use broad spectrum insecticides against another. That, that just doesn't work. Now out of those pests in peppers, aphids are the most problematic or always have been for me when I've worked in these crops. <clears throat> We have at least four species and have large sporadic invasions of them through the spring and summer. They produce live young and have very short life cycles. This leads to rapid population growth and we soon suffer serious economic damage. So once you get aphids in the crop in this protected environment, there's no time to, to waste. Right, another thing to stress at this point is that IPM is a knowledge based system. It's based on a four way interaction between the host plants, so that's our crop, the pests that we have to deal with, and they could be numerous, the beneficial organisms that we are either releasing or which we allow to come into the crop and, uh, and help us out, and of course the environmental conditions which we do have some considerable control over in the in the greenhouse environment. The point that I really need to make here is that any change we make is likely to impact on another component of the overall programme. So my second key point here is that IPM must be based on a solid foundation of knowledge. It also depends on topical information. Our decisions are based on regular crop monitoring. This is labour intensive, it requires skilled labour and therefore it's relatively expensive. So another key message, staff training is absolutely essential from the outset. So let's take a look at the components of IPM. Now, um, many people consider that IPM is just a synonym for, for biological control. Uh, and I guess it's true that biological control measures do form the backbone of our IPM programmes, but they're combined with physical, cultural con control measures and all integrated with compatible pesticides. Now this presentation today is going to focus on the biological and pesticidal um, components of that program, but I'll just give a couple of quick examples, first of physical and then cultural control, just to give you a flavour of the sort of thing that we that I include in these uh, in these categories. So an example of physical control is exclusion. You've heard something about that in field crops or, already. Um, here you can see glasshouse ventilators which are screened and also doorways are screened. 
confess not so common in the UK, but very common in um, in crops that are working in warmer climates. And the the objective here is to reduce the impact of sporadic invasions of, of flying pests. An example of cultural control, good hygiene for many, many different reasons. But the example I'm giving here is to eliminate green bridges which allow the survival of press pests between our crops and between treatments. <clears throat> OK, on to the biological. And of course, I'm going to focus on biological control agents of aphids because that's what it's all about today. But please bear in mind that simultaneously we'll be using lots of other biocontrols against the other pests that we that we have to uh, combat. So we deal with parasitic wasps, which are usually quite selective. So a, a particular species of parasitic wasp will usually attack one or a small number of species of, of aphids. We have predators which are more generalist um, <clears throat> and maybe uh, may attack all, all sorts of insects and mites, or they may be generalists within within, within aphids so that they, uh, they're not too fussy which type of aphids they eat. And of course, fungal pathogens, which you've heard quite a bit about already today. Right, so the parasitic wasps. You can see here uh, an aphidious wasp laying an egg into an aphid. The grub of the wasp develops inside the aphid. The aphid then takes on this mummified appearance and eventually an adult wasp will burst out of that, uh, that mummy and, uh, and go off to find other, other aphids. It's difficult to react to the sudden aphid invasions by releasing parasitic wasps because the wasp population tends to chase the aphid population for some, for some time before it gets control. But populations of the wasps can be maintained in advance of aphid arrival with open rearing units. This example I'm using here is, of, uh, is based on cereal plants which are infested with cereal aphids which are a common host to our parasitic wasps without being a, um, a threat to the crop. And the use of these open rearing units has given us very promising results, particularly in the early part of the season. But there is a catch, and that catch comes in the form of hyperparasites. Now, what you can see here is, uh, is another parasitic wasp laying its egg inside a mummified aphid where the grub of the hyperparasite feeds on the good guy within and eventually we get a parasitic wasp emerging, a hyperparasite emerging rather than a good guy. We found 10 different species of these hyperparasites operating in our crop. By mid-July we've uh, recorded over 70% hyperparasitism in, in some crops. The open rearing units may just be producing bad guys by that time. So another key point here is if you're depending on parasitic wasps, either by releasing them into your crop or natural populations moving in, then be aware of, of hyperparasites and the devastation they can cause to your biological system. Move on to predators now. Um, this is an aureus bug, an adult aureus bug, a very important component of our overall IPM program in peppers. You can, it uh, feeds on western flower thrips, but also, but it's a generalist and it will also attack aphids. These are the larvae of aphidolites midges, which are general aphid predators, um, but don't attack anything else. Uh, the problem is if we use both of these biological controls together, the, uh, these nice juicy maggots as they are, provide a, health, a nice food for the aureus bugs. We also find immature aureus bugs, that's what you can see down below, sniffing around our mummified aphids as we do the aphidolites larvae. Now, some of my colleagues in the biocontrol companies hotly dispute that um, 
that, that we see these sort of interactions, but I would say that is uh, rather suspicious and I have my doubts about this. So the message I want to get across is don't assume that throwing more species at a problem will always help. You may be feeding one type of biological control with another. And the key point here, be aware of interactions between species. And of course, this all comes back to that earlier key point that I made about it being based, a knowledge based system. OK, pesticides. When I talk to my students about um, about IPM, they're often surprised to find pesticides in, included in here at all. Um, almost as if it's heresy, but um, I use uh, chemical pesticides as a second line of defence. It's probably a new term to a lot of you, so I'll explain what I mean. So with biological control agents, we often see a situation like this, where the pest arrives in the crop and immediately starts to feed, reproduce, and the population starts to build up. So that's our pink line. There's usually a bit of a delay to start with, with the beneficial starts to feed on the pest, its own population builds up and it chases the pest population for some time, but eventually overhauls it and causes the pest population to crash. Now that's great if all of that happens before we reach an economic damage threshold. In fact, if that always happened, I probably wouldn't have had a job for the last 30 years. But in fact, our economic damage threshold is usually more in that sort of position on the chart. And this is where our second line of defence comes in. We use a secondary product to knock the top off that peak. Now, this needn't be a product which gives 90 percent plus control because all we're trying to do is redress the balance between the pest and the beneficial. So often 50 percent um, control of the pest is, is adequate to do that. Let me give an actual example from a, from some trials that we did a few years ago. So here's, here's a, a heavily infested um, pepper crop. We've got an average of over 100 aphids per leaf here, and at this point we've only got 5% parasitism. So if we haven't already crossed it, we're definitely heading for that orange economic damage line. So we introduced a second line of defence treatment here in the form of um, natural pyrethrins, which we sprayed into the top stratum of the, the crop. Now the natural pyrethrins have very short persistence. Um, they're harmful to the adult parasites, but they're not harmful to the immatures that are inside the mummies. So what we can do, and they're, and they're only persistent for, well, I, we think around about 16 hours in the crop. So sprayed one day, they've gone the next. So within two weeks, we start to see the crop growing away from the damage. And within four weeks, we have actually shifted the balance in favour of the parasites so that we've now got over 95% parasitism, which gives us sustainable control for a long time. I'll give some options for second line of defence treatments. The first are target specific chemical insecticides. Now, Perimore, uh, Perimicarb is a very good example of this. It's pretty obvious these are chemicals which uh, um, harm the pest, but not the beneficials. More, as we've got very few target specific chemical insecticides, and, and it seems that we have, uh, we, we've, that number is being reduced all the time, we're trying to use biopesticides in this way, and you've already heard today about how fungal uh, <clears throat> fungal pathogens are being used as um, in this type of way. <clears throat> we can also use short persistence insecticides, which are separated from biological control agents in either time or space. I've already given an example of how that can be done in space by um, only spraying part of the crop with a very short persistence product, natural pyrethrins, which uh, corrected that problem that we had in the in the pepper crop. We can also separate the insecticides from the biocontrol agents in time. For instance, if we get a huge invasion of 
aphids or, or moths, then we can knock that initial population down with a short persistence product before releasing our, our natural enemies. Or we can use systemic insecticides applied through the irrigation system. Now we've had a lot of success in peppers with uh, pymetrazine used in this way and in tomatoes with spinosad where the insecticide is put up is put into the plant, is carried up to the growing point in the plant. Anything that feeds on the plant is affected, but our biologicals, which are running around on the surface, um, uh, have, it has minimal effect on, on those. So key point here is second line of defense products provide a safety net. Now, even if you don't know, use the, the safety net, even if you don't need that in a particular season, it gives the confidence uh, to go ahead to embark on a, on a biological program if you know that that safety net exists. So I consider these second line of defence products to be absolutely essential in an IPM program. OK, moving on very rapidly, there are cost implications for IPM. <clears throat> very often uh, a grower uh, has to refine a, an IPM blueprint to suit his individual conditions in on his own site and for that reason he has his own research and development costs and may have to draw in people like myself to to help him out there are multiple control measures in ipm which are collectively more expensive than the routine use of broad spectrum insecticides and of course there's the additional labor for crop monitoring IPM is usually more expensive. So who pays? Well, growers' mar margins are already small. We've got to make, be allowed to make a living, or who's going to provide our our food? Will the public pay more? Well, we've all become used to paying rock bottom prices for our fresh produce, and. Uh, there would be a lot of reaction to trying to increase those products. Will the supermarkets reduce their margins? Well, there's an interesting thought, isn't there? So um, the key message is that the economics must be addressed to help growers uh, go down this, this route. OK, well, we're nearly there now, so what I'm going to do is go back over some of these key points. And look at what we have learned from these high value protected edible crops. First of all, IPM is complex, it should never be underestimated. It must be based on a foundation of knowledge. And staff training is vital uh, so that the crop monitoring can be done accurately. You must establish a full armory of compatible products against all the pests that you're likely to encounter at the outset. Using multiple biocontrol species may not help. You may simply end up feeding some biocontrols with others. Be aware of hyperparasites if your IPM program is heavily dependent upon parasitic wasps. Second line of defence products are important as safety nets. In fact, I'd go beyond that. I would say that second line of defence products are vital within your IPM program. And expect some additional production costs. Now, what I would say here is really try and engage your retail customers with um, with this concept. Don't just let them bully you into going down this this route and, and put in the bill yourself. Get them in, get them on board and get them to understand uh, the full program and um, what it what it involves. So despite these issues, we have excellent IPM programs in, in our pepper crops. And that goes for our tomato, cucumber and aubergine 
crops which are grown in a, in a similar way. I think that full range of crops in the UK are grown entirely with IPM, uh, with IPM and there is an absolute minimal use of pesticides used in them. Oh, thank you for your attention and uh, I guess I come back to the main screen now. Many thanks Rob uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, just before we we move on, um, just a question about with with your knowledge and expertise about IPM in protected situations, uh, where do you think we should be focusing our attention in in field crops? There's no there's no single uh, answer, you know solution to, to field crops. It's a case of just and, and Rosemary, you're, I know you're doing this and others are doing it already. Really got to just understand every aspect of um, of of that of crop production and analyze it all and make sure that there is a, 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 a IPM compatible control measure for every single pest that you're going to encounter. In the first place, um, some, sometimes you've just got to grow some crops without any pests, um, pest chemical pesticides at all, because um, there'll be secondary pests, as I call them, which are being taken out by the broad spectrum insecticides used against the main pests. You, you find that an IPM solution for those, take those out, and suddenly your secondary pests uh, are, are there and have to be controlled too. And that sometimes can be can come as a surprise and they've changed the status from secondary to primary pests simply because you haven't got an, a compatible control measure. So I guess what I'm saying is it comes back to that very first key point I made, IPM is complex. And you've got to understand <laughs> every aspect of it before you can go down a full IPM programme. Excellent, thank you very much. Right, so I think we'd better move on now. Um, so first of all, um, I personally wanted to thank all the speakers this morning. Um, we've been through um, a vast amount of information and I guess each of you um, could have um, had an hour long session with, with Q and A. Um, so thank you again, it's been really, really interesting. And I say, we will try and answer all the, the questions that have been typed in. Um, I'd also like to say thank you again to the AHDB team because I think um, they've done a great job under some challenging circumstances and uh, in my experience um, these platforms can be very surprising uh, at times. Um, and finally just to say uh, if you can please join a breakout session um, and and have your say. Um, we really appreciate your, your input. And now I'm going to hand over to Grace um, to provide you with details of the, the breakout sessions. Thank you, Rosemary. I think you've done a fantastic job. Uh, we, we're sitting in a room with her and we think she's been uh, brilliant uh, with everything we had this morning. I hope you can see my screen. Yes. Yes, um, uh, uh, just to point out uh, arrangements for our breakout sessions. So at the moment, I've got a screen there with additional resources and access. Um, we had on your tickets when you registered on Eventbrite, you could click through to a page and on the page there were links to publications that you could download as well as web pages uh, related to, to AFIDs and AFID control. So have a look, those links should still work. Basis and Neuroso, we've had a couple of questions on that as well. Neuroso points are available on that ticket. For basis points, please send your details to Maya Kotecha uh, and her email is there. I've put it on the slides for you. The recording uh, would be made available on our website and uh, like we said as well, because um, Harry, we had to stop Harry, uh, we'll ask him, he's, he's agreed actually to do narrated slides and we'll post those on our website. Also, I've noticed that uh, Ant Surridge has been answering questions that we weren't able to, to, to answer in the interest of time. So if there are any of our speakers that are still available and that are happy to answer those published questions, please go on and do that. 
So now we are headed to the breakout sessions. We've got those breakouts, a tree and soft fruit with, uh, with Jonathan Blackman, carrots uh, with Howard Hines, a brassicas Andy, and potatoes with John Sarup. Again, on your ticket, if you go back to Eventbrite ticket, you should be able to click through to these sessions uh, using, um, they, they are hyperlinked uh, to the sessions. So what do we want for these interactive sessions? Uh, like I said at the start, uh, oh, forgive me if you couldn't hear me earlier on, I've changed uh, my, my headset. Uh, but what the, the, the real point really for this event was we know that AFID control is, is, is a challenge. Uh, there are ways perhaps we need to consider uh, for, for next year. Um, and we've covered these in the morning sessions. Oh, we want people to use that information uh, you know, and their own experiences to contribute in the discussion sessions. So for this to work, we really need people to do, do, do we need buy-in from people. So you have to uh, either raise your up your hand and speak out, depending on how uh, your facilitator will guide you. So uh, we want uh, discussions on how AFID management strategies could be improved for 2021. Uh, you've got your facilitators and AHDB staff in the room who will explain how discussions will run. So each session, we've given them autonomy to decide how they will run dependent on how many people are in there and whether there's, you know, uh, good discussions going on. Again, we have uh, given them the go ahead to, to finish the session if we don't have uh, discussions. So uh, your contribution is in the interest of, of everyone as well as uh, the AHDB. Uh, We've recorded this uh, plenary morning session, uh, but the discussions will not be recorded because we want you to open up, to be frank, to open up. What we are noting, what the AHDB staff in your rooms are noting are just the gaps. Where does AHDB really need to go from here and any uh, follow on actions, um, but essentially the discussion sessions must lead to an aphid management strategy for the chosen crop, you know, something different to consider. It's an idea. What could you do based on what you know now? Um, and then also the identification of gaps in the aphid prevent detect control armory. So if you can highlight things that are missing there, please let us know so that we can take them forward in uh, SEPTA plus Amber PES program R and DNK work. Uh, and as I said, facilitators uh, will end the sessions and we will not meet uh, afterwards. So just to thank all our speakers, uh, I think you've done a, a fantastic job. Uh, uh, again, our apologies for, for, for that late start, uh, but also to thank you delegates. I think we had 166 at the start, um, so it, it's, you know, it shows how important these aphids are. Uh, obviously, other pests are important as well, but uh, we need you therefore to, to complete feedback forms that will be sent out to you uh, from our events team. Uh, please also provide in here additional comments on what else you might want to see on this topic. So if you go in uh, this year and you try something different and it doesn't work, maybe we want to hold something similar just to follow on on what's worked next year. So put in any other thoughts to help us uh, improve future events and to help guide us as well. Um, and again, the recording will be made available on the HDB events website. So whilst you're listening, I'm just going to take this opportunity to literally clap for Rose Rosemary Collier because she's done a fantastic job. There's like six people in here. Yeah, so we'll give her a clap and we'll say thank you. <laughs> that, that's really fantastic. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah, and now what we'll do is we'll have just a 15 minute lunch break. So I'm looking at the time here and it's 20 to 2. Well, about 20 to 2, so, <laughs> so we can 5, 10, 15. Uh, we, we could meet at, I don't know, should we just make, Rosemary, what do you think for, for the break? Should we come 11.55, I think, just to just get us, uh, sorry, 1.55 1 <laughs> 1 uh, to, to, to get us um, going again, and then your facilitators uh, will take, uh, we'll, we'll take you uh, forward in the discussion sessions. So thank you to our facilitators in advance and to you all. Um, see you later. Bye.